Our planet is full of different phenomena many of us have never heard of, and today we're going to be discussing one such phenomena that recently made itself announced once again. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and our story starts on Twitter. This wonderful person by the name of Mark Tenge recently posted a video that was circulating in the country of Azerbaijan that showed this. Now initially a lot of people assumed that this was an explosion in one of the many oil rigs in the country. Azerbaijan is known for its oil production. But a lot of scientists, including Mark, knew that something else is happening here. This right here is what's known as the Mud Volcano. A phenomenon that I think most of us have probably never heard of, mostly because it's localized to certain regions in the world. Now Mark actually explains a lot of different points about these volcanoes, although technically they're not true volcanoes, in a lot of his Twitter posts, but I'm going to try to give you a summary. So generally speaking, a mud volcano is something that erupts and something that's made out of mud. But despite the name, it's not a true volcano. It's something that erupts like a volcano, but it actually has a very different mechanism that involves a lot of pressure concentrating on the inside and usually contains muddy water. Although in many cases, it also contains a lot of different gas that's pressurized. But there are several locations in the world usually associated with volcanoes, actual volcanoes, that often have mud volcanoes next to them as well. Two examples here would be some locations in New Zealand and the Yellowstone National Park. There are several geological processes that usually produce mud volcanoes, but they're not igneous volcanoes, they do not actually produce any lava, and they're not driven by magmatic activity either. And generally, the eruptions do not produce anything superheated. As a matter of fact, usually the materials in the mud volcano are relatively cool, you can even touch it with your hands. But some of these formations, especially the ones in Azerbaijan, often erupt in a superheated mixture of mud and water, that could be as hot as 100 degrees Celsius or even more. But the pressurized buildup on the inside also has a chance to release a lot of different gases, including gases like methane that sometimes, as you can probably see right here, have a tendency to explode. Now in this case, the explosion itself was probably caused by some sort of a spark, probably from a lot of rocks flying away as well, and some of these rocks might have actually created the spark that ignited the methane and a lot of other gases released here. And as a result, it produced a fireball that was about 500 meters in height. And in general, even smaller mud volcanoes have a tendency to sort of set on fire and remain lit for a very, very long time. But because this was such a huge explosion, the initial assumption was that it was either an oil rig exploding or possibly even an attack. But this was of course not the case, especially because something like this in exactly the same spot happened back in 1958 as well. It was also around 500 meters in height and produced just as big of a fireball as it did right now. Now, interestingly, you might have actually never heard of these phenomena before. And also interestingly, a lot of them are really localized to this particular region in Azerbaijan. There are approximately 1100 known mud volcanoes in the world and almost half of them, approximately 400, are pretty much located in the region right here in the Caspian Sea in Azerbaijan which also includes some of the most violent and biggest mud volcanoes in the world. This one right here, known as Toragai, is the biggest known. It's actually roughly a few kilometers across, with this beautiful picture taken by the scientist by the name of Orhan Abasov. And because of this, a lot of these mud volcanoes are essentially a national symbol for the country, and are even used in certain religious practices. But even though a lot of these volcanoes, mud volcanoes, are not really dangerous and are more of a fascination, some of them, like this one right here that erupted in 2006 in Indonesia, have actually caused major destruction and a lot of damage in the past. This particular mud volcano eruption is known as Lushi, or Sidoarjo mud flow. And even though it started back in 2006, it hasn't stopped erupting since, dramatically transforming the entire region where it's located and creating this huge formation in the middle of an area where there used to be a town. Now today it's expected it's going to be erupting for possibly 20 years, maybe a little bit less, but it's not going to be stopping anytime soon. But because this is not a lava eruption but a mud eruption, it ends up producing a lot of different mud flows, which as you can see in this picture can be very destructive. This ended up displacing approximately 40,000 people that used to live here, and unfortunately there were also some fatalities. But luckily for us, nothing major happened here, except for the explosion itself. But because this happened so quickly on July 4th of 2021, American Independence Day I guess, 
It's not entirely, it's still not entirely clear exactly where this happened. There were some potential reports of a sudden heat wave coming from this region right here, reported by NASA satellites, but it's still not entirely clear if this was something entirely different. With the most likely location being this little island right here, located not so far away from the capital of Azerbaijan, Baku. So that's basically what we know about this so far. But there's one more important reason I wanted to talk about this. Something in regards to Mars. A few years ago, the scientists also realized that several interesting features on Mars also seem to resemble mud volcanoes, with a lot of features that were identified resembling something that we usually find in places like Azerbaijan as well. As a matter of fact, today a lot of scientists do suspect that Mars used to have mud volcanoes as well, and some of them were huge. And that's of course extremely important if this was true. That would imply that Mars had a lot of geological activity in the past, and a lot of it involved liquid water. At the same time, there were probably also natural gases, and on Earth at least, a lot of these natural gases are generally produced by some sort of bacterial life. So there are a lot of different questions that could be potentially answered if we were to investigate these ancient mud volcanoes on Mars by using some of the future probes. And since many of these Martian mud volcanoes also appear to be way, way bigger in size, with so many different ones located over the years, it actually does provide a very interesting opportunity to study this in more detail and possibly discover something absolutely incredible on Mars as well. So very recently, I was looking around the internet when I discovered that somewhere in Iceland, a group of entrepreneurs from the company known as Climeworks started the largest carbon capturing plant in the world. The facility whose only purpose is to try to capture as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as possible, and then send it really deep into the ground and convert it into some sort of a mineral. But around the same time, I also discovered several papers on a very interesting historical event that happened roughly around 55 million years ago that actually sort of transformed our planet. Hello, wonderful person. Today we're going to be talking about this particular event and what the scientists have recently discovered about one of the most dramatic climatic changes on the planet that released so much carbon that it actually increased the temperature on the planet by roughly around 8 degrees. The event that was so dramatic that if you were to compare this to the average temperature on the planet in the last 60 million years or so, you would see it as a very dramatic peak that happened right here and lasted for approximately 200,000 years. But because of the parallels between this particular event and what sort of is happening today, since 1997 a lot of geologists have actually been studying this event, using it as a kind of an analog for the effects of global warming and the effects of CO2 release and in trying to understand what exactly sort of happens to the planet when such a huge amount of CO2 is suddenly released into the atmosphere. And so in other words, as you probably have guessed, this is another climate change video. But this one has a slight twist. It's not a negative climate change video. It's a somewhat neutral and quite educational video you probably may want to consider watching. And let's actually go back to that picture I just showed you just to see something really interesting. Notice how the actual temperature goes up, but then suddenly drops just as dramatically. And that's actually one of the most interesting and to some extent, one of the most mysterious things about this particular event. First of all, we know that the carbon in this case was released for at least 20,000 years, possibly even as long as 50,000. But after about 200,000 years, the actual values of both temperature and carbon dioxide levels returned back to the levels prior to this event. So let's actually talk about what we think might have happened here and some of the theories in regards to this. First of all, all of this started sometime approximately 10 million years after the original extinction event that sort of made a lot of dinosaurs go extinct. But they're actually not connected at all. These are completely separate events. Now, right after the collision with the asteroid, the temperature on the planet was actually pretty warm. Actually, this is a period on the planet where the polar caps did not exist. You can sort of see how the planet looked like using this beautiful map that's in the description below created by the brilliant Ian Webster. But the planet sort of looked like this. So no polar caps, quite a lot of water everywhere. And as you can see, even Antarctica is basically a continent with a somewhat subtropical conditions. But the region we're interested in is right here. And so if we zoom in here, this is what the region looked like 50 million years ago. This is what the region looked like 90 million years ago. And this is sort of how it transformed afterwards. Now, interestingly, notice how Greenland in this case starts to move away farther and farther from the future Europe. And as it sort of moves away from here, 
It opens up this region right here that's currently referred to as the North Atlantic Igneous Province. Now, this province is most famous for what's happening on Iceland right now. All of the volcanoes there are basically because of this igneous region, but it was most active approximately 55 million years ago. As a matter of fact, some of the most iconic and most beautiful images from the United Kingdom, so for example, this one right here, known as the Giant's Causeway, located in Northern Ireland, or this beautiful cave known as the Fingal's Cave, were both formed during this extremely active igneous period. And because of the similarity in age and because of the igneous province suddenly appearing in the North Atlantic region around the same time, a lot of scientists believe that the PETM, as it's known, or Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, was most likely caused by some sort of volcanic activity, and in this case, very likely the North Atlantic activity that created these beautiful features. And although PETM does have other explanations, such as a potential comet, or possibly huge deposits of methane released from somewhere underneath the ocean, in this particular case, some of the recent studies make a definitive case for a volcanic activity in the North Atlantic region. With this recent paper right here, presenting a really strong argument and even explaining what they believe might have happened. And this event is extremely important to understand because, well, first of all, there are unusual similarities between the amount of CO2 released during this event and the sudden increase in temperature and also a somewhat sudden extinction of several species of animals in certain regions or in certain habitats. All of this kind of connects to what is happening to Earth today. And because of this, the scientists really want to understand how did the planet first of all recover, but also what's the worst case scenario? What would happen if the CO2 levels really sort of reached the extreme conditions? With the main concern not really being the ice caps or the increase in the water levels, but actually the acidification of the oceans. Unfortunately, the higher acidity in the oceans, which is correlated with the CO2, which ends up producing what's known as carbonic acid, unfortunately does lead to certain species going extinct. And so they wanted to take a look at this and wanted to compare it to what actually happened back then as well. But first of all, I guess let's start with the bad news. The bad news here is that, according to the study, currently the humans are releasing approximately 10 times more CO2 per year compared to the volcanic activity approximately 55 million years ago. But the good news is that the volcanoes here were releasing CO2 for approximately 20,000 years. We've only been doing so for maybe a few hundred years, so we still have a lot of time to somehow curb all of this and to possibly decrease the amounts released. Okay, quick side note, or I guess personal opinion. One of the major issues I have with the governments and I guess a lot of scientific communities communicating the issue of CO2 release right now is that it tells us we're doing something wrong, it tells us that we should stop doing something wrong, but it makes us feel sort of helpless, simply because people are telling us something bad is happening, but no one has actually given us a specific guideline for how to stop CO2 release or for how to stop climate change. Now, this is something I'm going to be addressing in one of the future videos, because I do have some guidelines, but my personal opinion right now is that a lot of us have actually reached the stage of what's known as learned helplessness. It's sort of the stage you reach when you realize that there's nothing you can do. Something bad is happening, everyone is talking about it, it's all around you, but you feel absolutely useless and you sort of shut down and you stop thinking about it, or maybe you start doing something that's entirely opposite. This is actually a really interesting topic and it was originally discovered by studying dogs and specifically by shocking dogs to the point where they would become completely depressed. They would do absolutely nothing and would just continuously get shocked. It's a very sad study and there are some really, really sad pictures I don't want to show, but the study allowed us to understand that anyone can reach this. So if everyone is bombarded with the climate change is bad, we're destroying the planet, but no guidelines are provided and no one is actually giving us any positive or any reinforcing ideas, it actually creates a completely opposite effect. So anyway, more about this later, and more about that later as well. So you know, subscribe if you don't want to miss those videos. Anyway, back to the point. So during that peak, during the PETM, the fossil records show us that approximately 1 gigaton of carbon was released per year for thousands and thousands of years. Humans currently release about 10 gigatons of carbon. And so obviously if we do this for a thousand years, it will very likely have very similar effects. At the same time, same fossils showed us that there was a major turnover of certain types of animals. And this is, I guess, really ironic. Because of this event, or because of these dramatic changes of climate, a lot of species, including early primates, 
i.e. our ancestors, actually got a chance to dominate their particular habitats. This one right here, known as Archicebus achilles, is one of the most well-known examples from about 55 million years ago and originally came from China. And so the event that sort of created primates as one of the top species by removing a lot of competition is now to some extent also being caused by primates, by us. But the extinction event on the surface of the planet was really not that dramatic and to some extent wasn't even that important. What happened in the oceans though was sort of important, mostly because of the acidification. For example, certain types of organisms living in the oceans, especially the ones relying on calcium to create the shells or any other parts of the skeleton, went extinct, or at least dramatically decreased in numbers. These tiny grains that are only about 5 mm in size still exist today and can be found around certain parts of Japan, and this is known as foraminifera, with the organism in this case known as basugypsina. But the organisms that did not rely on calcium or certain other types of organisms especially certain types of subtropical dinoflagellates, exploded in numbers and took over the habitats that used to belong to other species. So essentially some species disappeared, but some species became way way more successful. With the fossils suggesting that this was happening pretty much everywhere, the oceans, the land, and very likely affected pretty much every major habitat, so it was sort of like a turnover of species. The animals that used to be successful most likely disappeared, the animals that were not so successful took their place. But there were some other major changes to the planet as well. For example, one major change that's somewhat difficult to study and currently is very difficult to understand is actually in regards to ocean currents. Apparently during this time, for about a few hundred thousand years, the ocean currents also changed dramatically, changing the way that the heat was propagated on the planet. Certain regions that used to be warm became much cooler and vice versa. This is, by the way, something that's already sort of slowly happening on the planet as well. It's not really that dramatic yet, but it is slowly happening. For example, at least one study was able to discover that there was something referred to as the backwards flow, referring to a major change of the water transport in the depth of the ocean, which actually enhanced the warming even more. And so certain types of ocean currents will actually increase the overall temperature on the entire planet. But because of all of these changes, up to about 50% of all of the ocean species very likely went extinct, especially some of the simple organisms that ironically survived the extinction during the dinosaur era. And in this case, it most likely happened because of the length of the event. The asteroid strike only changed the climatic conditions on the planet for possibly a few decades, maybe a hundred years. But the ocean currents in this case very likely were affected for at least 40,000 years, so a much longer period for someone to survive. But what's really difficult to explain and what's actually somewhat difficult to understand is why the mammalian species, especially early horses, early monkeys, and a lot of other mammals that became prominent for millions of years, started to appear and actually started to dominate during this period. Although many of them were much, much smaller in size. As a matter of fact, today it's believed that because of the carbon dioxide levels, or extremely high carbon dioxide levels, the conditions on the planet encouraged what's known as dwarfism. Very likely because the levels of oxygen were sort of lower, and the levels of CO2 were much higher, so it would be much more difficult for a larger animal to be able to breathe and provide enough energy to their entire body. But following this period and following the changes for a few thousand years, there was also a major recovery period. Which means that somehow the planet was able to very suddenly capture and store all of this carbon dioxide, reducing the levels once again. Now this is something we still don't understand, and we don't even understand where the carbon actually came from, but this is an extremely intriguing and very crucial time on the planet that we can technically use as a case study for what might happen in the next few hundreds of years. But back to the study. So what exactly have they actually learned? Well, first of all, they were able to confirm the origins being volcanic. In this case, the scientists were able to confirm that there were very large deposits of mercury present in the North Sea in the North Atlantic. And generally speaking, high levels of mercury are usually correlated with major releases from igneous provinces from essentially volcanoes. Although in this case, it was very likely an underwater volcano, an extremely large underwater volcano, something that would be hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of square kilometers in size. Or to be more exact, this would be an igneous province, so not just one volcano with a single eruption. But basically, a lot of smaller volcanoes here and there, all of them releasing a lot of material. 
But one major surprise discovered in the study that actually sort of applies to what's happening on the planet today is that only the initial stages of this event show the releases in Mercury, but the climatic changes, the CO2 levels, and the overall temperature on the planet were still increasing even after the levels of Mercury started to drop. And what this implies is that the volcanic eruption very likely started the actual process. But once the volcano stopped, something else continuously released more and more CO2, suggesting that there was actually another carbon source that was suddenly unlocked by all of this activity. Or in other words, the volcanic eruption sort of served as a trigger for a release of another source. It could have been coming from some sort of a permafrost in some colder regions, or it could have been very large deposits of methane on the ocean floor, but whatever it was, the initial volcanic eruption that lasted probably a few hundred years or maybe a thousand years, served as a trigger for that secondary emission. The emission that would not happen otherwise unless something disturbed it. And today we believe that something similar could happen on Earth as well. And so in this case, by warming up the planet just enough, we could potentially trigger the release of methane or even more CO2 from some of the regions where it was trapped for thousands or even millions of years. So one such region of course being permafrost. And so this paper definitely suggests that there was some sort of a tipping point. This tipping point mechanism is one of the biggest factors worrying a lot of climate scientists today as well. We don't really know where these major deposits could come from, but by releasing just enough CO2, we could hypothetically cause the planet to start warming up dramatically even beyond our control. And because this period right here is technically the fastest period of warming in Earth's history, there's definitely a lot of lessons for us to learn here. But Looking back at the graph, we can see that the planet recovered pretty quickly, and this was very likely also the result of volcanoes. Ironically, another study that came out not so long ago talks a lot about this. The irony of volcanoes, or specifically volcanic rock, is that it also tends to trap a lot of CO2 in the long term. And here it's usually the process that we normally call weathering. When the volcanic rocks are weathered, a lot of calcium and magnesium is deposited into the water. And this then ends up producing a lot of calcium compounds and magnesium compounds that have CO2 on the inside, for example, calcium carbonate. And so for planet Earth, this actually serves as a natural mechanism to control the levels of CO2. When there's a lot of volcanic eruption, it sort of increases the conditions on the planet for just a little bit, but then the CO2 levels will drop dramatically as a lot of the rock is weathered, and as lots and lots of different sedimental compounds are produced in very large amounts by the volcanic rock. And so in some sense, volcanoes are these thermostats. They control the weather on the planet. They make things warm, or they make things cool down. But the cooling down process is usually much, much slower. As a matter of fact, it can take thousands or even millions of years. And so unfortunately today, the amount of CO2 released by humans is approximately 150 times higher than is being trapped by the volcanic rock or by weathering effects. Nevertheless, a lot of scientists have started to think that maybe we can somehow employ this and use it alongside the other carbon capture devices to potentially trap even more CO2 in various deposits. And so here we're talking about what's known as the artificially enhanced rock weathering. The process where the rocks are sort of pulverized, turned into powder, spread across a very large area, and are forced to create more carbon compounds, thus trapping even more CO2 in the process. Now this is obviously in its infancy, but if things are going the way they're going, this particular technology might actually be on the forefront of future research. And so I think it's really just a matter of time before someone turns this into some sort of a startup or some sort of an entrepreneurial venture. But the lessons from all of these studies and from essentially all of these investigations are somewhat promising. First of all, the planet seems to recover pretty well. And this right here shows us how well. The recovery only took a few thousand years. But unfortunately for us, we don't really know if we're going to be one of these surviving species. Which is why I personally believe this is still a really important topic to talk about and to not just talk about or to tell people about, but to actually find practical solutions to. Which is actually something we're going to be discussing in one of the future videos. Hello on Focus, and this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a pretty cool discovery of something else about our own oceans that we didn't really know before. Specifically, a completely new carbon cycle that seems to exist in the oceans that we never knew existed or never even knew was possible. Something that also helps us answer how oceans on our planet can actually maintain themselves 
and to some extent how they can clean things like for example oil spills. So let's discuss this in a little bit more detail because the discovery does have some profound implications, but it also shows us how little we really know about our oceans. But let's start with something a little bit more negative this time. Oil spills. When a typical oil spill occurs somewhere in the oceans, most of the resulting damage is usually done to animals that are, well, larger. For example, birds, furred mammals, or some types of fish. But generally, these large oil spills tend to disappear within only a few months, possibly maximum a year after the original event. And what scientists were always kind of shocked about is how quickly the biomass in this particular region gets kind of reshuffled and rebalanced and how certain bacteria and certain algae become the dominant species in the area. And so even though certain animals that are used to certain conditions are definitely affected by this, smaller things, specifically things from the world of microbiology, seem to actually prosper in these conditions. And certain bacteria such as Alcanivorex have even started to be used in assisting certain cleanups because they're so effective at breaking down all of the material present in a typical oil spill. And so generally any kind of an oil spill is usually followed by a huge bloom of different types of bacteria and algae in a certain region. But naturally all of these bacteria don't just depend on oil to survive. They must have some sort of other cycle they're part of and probably consume a lot of other hydrocarbons coming from somewhere else. And the scientist whose paper you can find in the description below wanted to find out more about these unusual cycles that might exist in our oceans and also just find out how these bacteria interact with the rest of the oceans. But to their surprise, they've actually discovered something completely different. A completely new carbon cycle that nobody else knew existed. A cycle that relates to this molecule you see on the screen, known as pentadecane. A molecule that we basically know very little about. Except for the fact that, well, it seems to be part of certain animals and certain plants, and it seems to do something in the metabolism of those animals and plants. And everything else for now is a big mystery. And a few years ago, scientists actually discovered that this particular compound was also actively produced by bacteria living in the oceans. Something that they couldn't really explain right away, but something that they wanted to investigate as well. And to try to investigate all of this, the scientists had to go on a relatively long ocean trip to try to find a spot somewhere in the oceans that wasn't really polluted with artificial pollutants. And they found several such spots in the North Atlantic, they also took some samples from the Gulf of Mexico, and also made sure that everything was done extremely carefully, for example making sure that the ship was positioned in a very specific way so that the pollutants brought by the wind or by the currents weren't really contaminating the samples, also no one was allowed to cook, to paint anything, to smoke, no one was allowed to do anything that could contaminate the samples produced in this study. So as you can probably imagine, it was not a particularly joyful ride for certain people. But in the end, when the samples were collected and brought back and analyzed, everything seemed to be pretty clear. First of all, the samples were definitely not contaminated. Second of all, they definitely contained unusual compounds such as pentadecane. And what's more is that this had some sort of a cycle going on, with the amount of pentadecane being correlated with the amount of cyanobacteria present in the water. And since cyanobacteria are some of the most prolific producers of different organic matter and are also responsible for producing a lot of oxygen that we breathe as well, it should not really come as a surprise that they also produce certain other hydrocarbons that are used by bacteria in the oceans. Although don't get confused, the cyanobacteria producing these compounds and the bacteria consuming them are totally different from each other. The green stuff here produces the organic molecules using sunlight and essentially are photosynthesizing all of these compounds using the carbon dioxide, water and the sunlight. Whereas certain other bacteria and certain other archaea are then responsible for essentially consuming all of this and most likely releasing the CO2 back into the oceans as well. And the amounts used and produced here are actually quite staggering. The scientists here mentioned that the total mass of these compounds produced is probably around 500 times more than all of the compounds released into the waters through artificial means, for example petroleum spills or just natural seeps from the ocean floor itself where the bacteria most likely uses these compounds as well. And the total production is up to about 600 million metric tons of hydrocarbons produced every single year. And the way that the scientists currently think the pentadecane is used in bacteria is by allowing certain bacteria with very curved shapes to basically kind of build a structure for the cell so it doesn't break apart. And at least one study in the last few years investigated the presence of these hydrocarbons 
as essentially the potential source for the formation of cell membrane of various bacteria. And since the cycle here definitely correlated with the presence of cyanobacteria in the water, and since the pentadecanes discovered in these samples were also confirmed to be biological in nature, there is very little to doubt that the cyanobacteria and the bacteria present in the water definitely have some sort of a relationship going on with one producing the compound and the other one consuming it. And it wasn't just one or two bacteria, there were at least a dozen different organisms identified that seemed to be thriving in these conditions, which also presented it to the next question here. Does it also mean that these particular bacteria would be responsible for these cleanup activities that we usually see around a typical oil spill in the oceans? Because normally these are followed by various blooms of bacteria of all sorts. And this is of course where the scientists were actually shocked to discover that the bacteria captured from the samples that essentially relied on pentadecane did not care much for oil or any kind of petroleum spills. In other words, unlike the assumption here that they're going to bloom in these conditions when there's a lot of various types of hydrocarbons coming from oil spills, which would of course help us explain how the oil spill cleanup happens and how carbon circulates in the oceans, the scientists found something completely different. They discovered that pentadecane seems to have its own cycle dependent on its own bacteria that do not care for oil or for any petroleum products. And so the original assumption where the scientists thought that there is a short cycle with cyanobacteria and bacteria circulating together, producing and consuming various types of hydrocarbons, was not at all related to the other cycle, long cycle, that usually depends on all sorts of oil formation, which of course includes oil spills, but it also includes natural production of oil from within the soil, which was further reinforced with DNA tests that suggested that the bacteria in the pentadecane study and the bacteria in oil spills produce completely different proteins responsible for breaking down these uh, hydrocarbons. And this of course implies that this newly discovered hydrocarbon cycle is something we know absolutely nothing about, mostly because we have very little information about the molecule, about the organisms involved in this cycle, even though it's like millions and millions of tons of it that seems to circulate the planet pretty much every year. And this of course means several things. First of all, there seems to be an organism that seems to thrive on whatever you put in the water. Not everything of course, but in most cases, no matter what actually happens in the oceans long term, there's always going to be some sort of a bloom where a certain bacterium or a certain organism is going to start using it as their primary source and thus become the dominant organism, at least for the time being. But this also usually leads to a tremendous change in the biosphere of a certain region and can actually damage certain regions permanently. At the same time, all this also implies that there are a lot of different cycles in the oceans and we know so little about them. Our primitive understanding of the so-called carbon cycle usually involves the circulation of carbon dioxide and various chemical reactions related to it. But that's a very old and a somewhat primitive approach. Today we know that there are a lot more really, really complex cycles going on everywhere around us, but it's also really important for us to get acquainted with these cycles and to try to understand how all of this interacts on the planet and how all of this influences organisms around us. We know that the typical oil spill usually throws everything out of balance, but then balance returns and things generally go back to normal. So there are a lot of feedback mechanisms and a lot of different mechanisms going on in the oceans that we actually have to understand a little bit better. But even though in the long term we know that the oceans are going to adapt to whatever is thrown at them, so even if there's a major catastrophe and sort of a major condition change where the oceans become completely different from what they are now, the organisms are still going to adapt. The problem is everything else that depends on those oceans, including the larger organisms like birds, mammals, and of course us, are unfortunately not going to be able to adapt to this and most likely perish just like it happened so many times in history. And that's of course why it's super important for us to study our oceans and to learn to understand what happens in them and also to learn more about these various cycles going on in there because we naturally started to influence them as well. And that's something that we need to learn more about before we really screw up to the point of no return. It's not going to affect bacteria, but it's definitely going to affect us. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be tackling the question of origin of life on planet Earth once again and specifically focusing on the chemistry and the sources of one of the most important but often overlooked elements inside our bodies, phosphorus. 
specifically focusing on the surprising origins of phosphorus in our bodies. So let's discuss this in a little bit more detail, but let's start with what exactly is phosphorus for and why is it so important for life? And this is of course a somewhat important question, mostly because there are certain elements inside our bodies that have a very specific origin and if we understand where these elements came from, we might be able to identify some other regions in, for example, our galaxy, where we could potentially find some other similar life to us. Although, as we've discussed in some of the previous videos, at the moment, it really looks like Earth seems to be an extremely lucky and a very special planet. It seems to have met all the requirements for complex life to develop here. But anyway, normally when it comes to looking for life or trying to identify the potentials for life, most of the scientific papers focus on various types of carbon and specifically various organic molecules combined with presence of water. Now, that's unfortunately far from being enough for complex life to develop. As a matter of fact, if you look inside our DNA molecules or basically try to dissect our bodies in terms of the actual molecular structure, you're going to discover two other elements that are really important. Specifically, nitrogen, which is what our atmosphere is made out of, and phosphorus, which in this image is seen as these yellow balls that you see in some parts of the DNA. But apart from the DNA, the phosphorus in our bodies is also found in a lot of other regions. For example, every single cell in our body is made out of what's known as the phospholipid bilayer. And just like the name implies, it contains a lot of phosphorus everywhere. On top of this, the most important unit of energy in our bodies, this molecule right here, known as adenosine triphosphate, is also filled with phosphorus and is absolutely essential for the functioning of every cell in our bodies. It's basically the most universal unit of energy used by most of life on Earth. And so because of the abundance of phosphorus and its abundance in pretty much most of life on the planet, it's a natural question to ask, where did it come from? Now the obvious answer here is that, well, it was always there. It was always inside the initial cloud from which the solar system was created, and large amounts of it was probably included inside the planet Earth as it was forming from all of this gas. But there's a small problem with this explanation. Phosphorus has a very specific property that makes this a siderophile element. It's an element that seems to like to stick to iron. Or in other words, if you were to put iron and phosphorus together, it's actually going to form a compound and thus sink to the bottom of the planet. Which of course implies that early in the creation of the solar system, pretty much most of the phosphorus very likely sank into the core of our planet and is still there today. And this would mean that there would be practically almost no phosphorus left on the surface for any life to form. It has to have come from somewhere else and very likely had to arrive for many millions or even billions of years because a lot of it would still react with various elements on the surface and transform into other compounds. And so the assumption here was always that it probably came from various asteroids and various comets. But the exact details of this were not really well known or well understood. As a matter of fact, it was sort of just an assumption and not really a really good explanation. And so that's pretty much what the new study tries to do. It proposes a very interesting theory, suggesting that a lot of phosphorus didn't just come from the asteroids, it also came from a lot of cosmic dust, and most importantly, it actually has undergone a very specific chemical reaction in the upper atmosphere of our planet to then change it into something that life could use. In other words, a lot of these smaller factors played a very important role in transforming phosphorus into one that can be then used by life. And there's actually a reason I'm showing you this picture right here, taken by one of the scientists from the European Southern Observatory. This shows you what's known as the zodiacal light, and that's basically cosmic dust. And we know that tons of this cosmic dust is constantly deposited on our planet and can even be seen from outer space. I've talked about this in one of the previous videos and you can also find a video from Scott Manley that goes into more detail about this. But this yellowish orange glow you see right here, that's basically the layer produced by collisions from various micrometeorites and a lot of cosmic dust. It's essentially the layer made out of tiny tiny pieces of rock, sodium layer. But there are quite a lot of other elements present in this region, including things like sulfuric acid that usually shows as bluish in color and a lot of other stuff that just doesn't show up at all, it's simply invisible. And so a lot of the stuff that's usually inside asteroids and micrometeorites, including of course metals, including various organic compounds, and of course including phosphorus, 
over time gets deposited in the upper atmosphere and stays there for quite some time. But in order for phosphorus to become useful for life, it has to transform into something known as phosphate. It essentially has to undergo a chemical reaction. But on Earth, because of the presence of metals and because of a lot of other stuff, normally this would be somewhat difficult. It would usually transform into something that cannot be used by life. And so a very specific set of chemical reactions have to take place in order to stabilize phosphorus and to make it usable for life. And that is exactly what the authors in this paper propose. They suggest that all of this cosmic dust entering the upper atmosphere undergoes a series of very specific chemical reactions as it travels through the atmosphere. And by the time it makes it closer to the surface of the planet, it's basically transformed into one of those useful phosphates. But one of the more important parts of the reaction is what we usually refer to as ablation. Here is ablation visualized. It's the heating up of the material as it enters the atmosphere at a relatively high speed. And as the material heats up, it actually starts a lot of different chemical reactions with a lot of other stuff that's already in the upper atmosphere. And so because of this process of ablation, it essentially frees up all of the molecules trapped inside the meteorite or asteroid or cosmic dust. And then on top of this, also provides all of the energy needed for various complex chemical reactions. With all of this, of course, implying that cosmic dust and various micrometeorites are essentially responsible for providing all of the necessary phosphorus for billions of years, but with all of it transforming in the upper atmosphere as it entered the planet. And that's, of course, the important part. And based on this model and this theory, they also make a few predictions about potential presence of phosphorus in some of the parts of the atmosphere of the planet. For example, one of the predictions here is a relatively narrow layer of phosphorus approximately 90 kilometers above the ground. Something that was never really detected before, but something that should be testable using some of the modern techniques, including, of course, various types of sounding rockets. But here they actually expect different types of phosphorus to be present in different amounts at different altitudes, with the vast majority being detectable right here as something they refer to as OPO. But apart from the altitude, they also develop a model that predicts the most amounts of phosphorus received based on the geographical location with the red spots right here suggesting the highest volumes of phosphorus received. And interestingly, it's the Rockies in North America, the Andes in South America, and the Himalayas in Asia. And although it's not entirely clear how this is important just yet, it's still a really interesting discovery. Obviously, a few billion years ago, when the life was just beginning, none of these mountain ranges existed yet. But I guess by testing the amounts of phosphorus in these regions, it would be possible to potentially prove this theory. More importantly, the research definitely shows that a very large amount of phosphorus that falls onto the planet from various types of cosmic dust seem to end up as biologically useful phosphorus. So basically not phosphorus that turns inorganic and attaches itself to iron. And surprisingly, all of this is because of the ablation and various chemical reactions happening in the upper atmosphere, which is a really important finding. It once again suggests that there is something special about planet Earth. In this case, it's the atmospheric layer that provides all of this chemistry that's basically ready to produce life molecules, or life-giving molecules, or organic molecules. And so naturally, something like this would be practically impossible on, for example, the Moon, modern-day Mars, or a lot of other regions in the solar system that do not possess these features. And that, of course, applies to other exoplanets as well. So in order for life to form on some exoplanet far away, it would still have to have very similar conditions to the upper atmosphere of planet Earth, where all of these chemical reactions can take place. But the researchers also raise a somewhat important question at the end of their study. It would be interesting to find out if something similar or even more extreme was happening around the time when life transformed on our planet. For example, during the so-called Great Oxygenation event that saw a major transformation of life on the planet or if there were any other transformational periods on the planet when life changed dramatically because of the changes in the atmospheric chemistry of the planet. So this is something that scientists will hopefully explore in some of the future studies, but for now that's sort of all we know. A really interesting proposition, a somewhat cool discovery, and a potential explanation to once again why life on Earth seems to be kind of special. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton. And this right here is a map I've been meaning to use for a very, very long time. This is a map showing us approximately one year of earthquakes on planet Earth. 
but it's a map that shows it to us in three dimensions. Created by this wonderful person, Rakula Nikola, a cartographer from Switzerland who's created a lot of these in the past. Now, as always, the link for this is in the description below. But I guess what I personally find fascinating here is that you can actually zoom into pretty much any location on planet Earth and then investigate each of these earthquakes, discovering the approximate depth, the total magnitude and the approximate location of this particular earthquake, allowing us to sort of visualize where all of this happens at all times. Now, one thing about this map is that things here are a little bit exaggerated. As a matter of fact, the depth is about 8 times larger than it is in reality. So in other words, if it says the earthquake was about 100 kilometers in depth, it's going to look like it's 800 kilometers. And this was done for artistic reasons, just to make this a little bit easier to see visually. But nevertheless, the map itself is really, really good at presenting this information. And it just so happens that a perfect study came out when I finally got to use this map and to showcase it to you. The study that you can also find in the description below. And this time the study uncovered something that's a little bit difficult to explain the deepest earthquake ever detected. Discovered at a depth of about 751 kilometers, or about 467 miles. So deep as a matter of fact, that barely anything was detected on the surface of the planet, even though the earthquake itself was pretty powerful. It was 7.9 in magnitude, which is considered to be pretty high. And so let's talk a little bit more about why this is actually a mystery that's extremely difficult to solve, and just about the general idea of these deep earthquakes and how we believe they are usually formed. So first of all, when it comes to earthquakes, we have a pretty good understanding of how exactly they occur and what exactly makes them happen. In a nutshell, it's usually because of some sort of a massive mineral somewhere deep in the ground. And here, usually everything is caused because of the plate tectonics. As a lot of different plates of planet Earth move around, and as they either interact with one another, or sometimes go on top of one another, one of them can start reaching extreme pressures. And at some point, all of the minerals that it's made out of can actually crack completely, releasing a tremendous amount of energy and producing the earthquakes. And so one of the major components here is the ability for the mineral to crack. So basically something has to break for the earthquake to appear. Interestingly, one of the reasons we are not entirely sure how it works on other planets is because of the components or minerals that they're made out of. So for example, if certain minerals are a lot more brittle, if they break easier, chances are, well, first of all, the crust is not going to be as strong and the earthquakes are probably going to be extremely minuscule. On the other hand, if the crust is extremely strong, it can maybe potentially produce extremely powerful earthquakes, but can also block the plate tectonics completely. So in other words, the composition of minerals is extremely important in determining what happens on the surface of the planet. But the thing about minerals is that, well, first of all, they're very diverse and they depend on the components or the elements on the inside, but second of all, they also change with pressure and temperature. So for example, here on planet Earth, the mineral responsible for basically snapping and releasing all of this energy is this green mineral known as olivine. This is the primary component of the upper mantle of planet Earth, and there's quite a lot of it on the inside. And pretty much most of the earthquakes on planet Earth, as you can see from this map, happen in this upper mantle because of the snapping of olivine as it experiences pressure from, for example, two plates colliding, or for example, when one of the plates experiences pressure from elsewhere. But there's another way some of the earthquakes happen, and that's when one mineral transitions into another mineral. And that's something that starts happening once we start going deeper and deeper into the Earth's mantle. So here, up to about 100 kilometers in depth, it's still olivine and it's still relatively brittle. But once we reach depths of 100 to maybe 300 kilometers, that's when another factor comes into play. And let's use this beautiful model of the eclair with cream filling because, well, I like eclairs and because that's basically the best footage I could find, to essentially demonstrate what happens at higher depths. A lot of the liquids present in rocks, especially liquids in various pores, start to get squeezed out and under these conditions the rocks acquire more brittleness and so they actually can break even easier. And because of this there are quite a lot of earthquakes up to about 400 kilometers because of the transition of essentially olivine with a little bit of liquids on the inside into some other rocks that have almost no liquids, it sort of creates another opportunity for earthquakes to occur. Even though at these conditions, at these pressures and temperatures, the olivine itself should technically no longer be brittle. And so up to about 400 kilometers, these two explanations sort of make sense. But the thing is, if we go back to this map and we look at some of the deeper earthquakes, 
We'll actually discover something a little bit more unusual, like for example this one right here was at a depth of 560 kilometers. This one here was 668 kilometers. And as you can see, there are quite a lot of these deep earthquakes happening right here near Fiji. You can also use this earthquake catalog from USGS to try to discover some of the other deep earthquakes with at least one recent earthquake happening right here once again in Fiji at a depth of about 605 kilometers. And so these deeper earthquakes, they seem to be pretty common, but they're a lot more difficult to explain because at this point, the rocks become way, way less brittle. And this takes us to the next explanation. So at this depth of about 400 kilometers or approximately 250 miles, the beautiful green olivine starts to transform into another mineral. It transforms into what's known as the Wotleyite. And so once the atoms here rearrange, it becomes this bluish mineral, which changes its structure, changes its density, and thus can cause even more earthquakes at some of the bigger depths. Usually this transition happens really, really suddenly, and this sudden transition from one mineral to another can usually cause another earthquake. And once we start going deeper, so here we're talking about 500 kilometers, this transforms into some other stuff. For example, one of the common minerals found at these depths is something known as ringwoodite. So once again, very, very similar composition, but extremely different crystal structure because of the pressures and temperatures. And once you keep going deeper and deeper, even that starts transforming into, for example, Pericles at a depth of about 680 kilometers. And so in theory, all of these deep earthquakes can be caused by the transition of one mineral to another as the plates move around and as they sort of push each other deeper and deeper into the Earth's mantle although the actual true cause of these deep earthquakes is still not well understood. But that's up to a depth of about 680 kilometers. The newly discovered earthquake was even deeper than that. Here, the measurement suggested the depth of about 750 kilometers. And so what exactly caused this earthquake to occur is not a question anyone can answer right now. Although I guess that's not entirely true. There's at least one potential explanation. First of all, olivine could be just extremely unpredictable and might even have a chance to stay as olivine and not transform into anything for much longer than we initially thought. Whereas in some other cases, maybe olivine has a chance to skip a few phases and to just transform into its last stage right away. So it's still not clear to us, mostly because we don't really have anything like this happening here on the surface. So obviously we have, for example, water turning into ice, with both substances then having very different properties, but this is very, very different from what we are seeing inside the planet itself. Here we're talking about pretty much exactly the same element, transitioning into very different stages with very different properties, with some of them being a little bit more difficult to predict than others. So for example, one potential explanation here is once again with different plate tectonics and specifically with convergent plates. Let's say one of these plates, this one right here, has quite a lot of olivine located right here and it's being pushed lower and lower into the Earth's mantle. But it could just happen that in this particular location, the mantle is just a little bit cooler than it should be for the olivine to transition into its other state. The pressure is correct, but the temperature is not. And so if we use the water as an analogy here, it's kind of like having water boil much, much sooner at lower temperatures if you go into lower pressures, for example, on top of a mountain. And so maybe in some conditions, for example, in those places in Fiji, the temperatures are just not high enough for the olivine to transition. And so as the plates push some of this olivine lower and lower, at some point it's going to reach the area where both the temperature and the pressure is just enough for it to suddenly transition into a new stage, which then suddenly releases a huge amount of energy, creating a powerful earthquake that we can detect from very far away. And that's one potential explanation to that extremely deep earthquake the earthquake in the regions of the mantle where we really don't expect anything to break or to create any kind of earthquake whatsoever. At these depths, at 750 kilometers, the actual mantle should be very, very liquid-like. It becomes this very viscous, liquidy substance that shouldn't really break anything and should not produce any earthquakes. And so that's one of the potential explanations for this record-breaking deep earthquake. But obviously nobody knows if this is exactly what happened and it would be very difficult to find out. As a matter of fact, even detecting this earthquake required extremely sensitive instruments, not knowing this was happening on the surface. And the only reason all of this was even detected was because of this extremely sensitive network of earthquake detectors located in Japan, the network known as HINAT. And this is the world's most powerful earthquake detector. 
Mostly because for Japan this is a huge hazard and so they always have to be prepared for any potential earthquake. And so a pretty intriguing discovery from within the planet Earth. But I guess one other discovery out of all of these papers and all of these studies is the fact that, well, the boundary inside planet Earth doesn't seem to be a boundary at all. Or in other words, even though we generally imagine planet Earth to have these relatively well-defined parts and layers within it, it doesn't seem to be like this at all. It really looks like all of these layers on the inside are extremely diverse and sometimes don't even have very definitive start or end points. And so all of this is a somewhat simplified version of what the planet looks like on the inside. Okay, so here's an interesting proposition. What if all of these mountains you're looking at right here were actually created because of the effects from the biosphere, from life? Or in other words, what if a lot of these really large mountains on our planet were actually sort of created with the participation of life itself? Now that's quite a proposition, but that's exactly what this new paper you can find in the description below proposes, and it sort of makes sense. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about this somewhat interesting and possibly groundbreaking study that might help us understand how biosphere influences the geology of our planet and might also help us understand how all of this would work on other planets as well. So let's discuss this in a little bit more detail, but let's actually start right here, on another planet that has geology we're quite familiar with, planet Mars. Now, interestingly, the geology of Mars is extremely different from what we have on our own planet. For example, you're not going to find a lot of stereotypical mountains. You're going to find things like this right here, this really, really huge valley you see known as Valles Marineris. And you're also going to find places like Olympus Mons, or the biggest volcano in the solar system, but none of them are anything similar to what we have on planet Earth and were actually formed in entirely different ways. And the main reason behind this is because Mars doesn't have the same geological functions or the same geological activity as planet Earth. For example, it doesn't have what's known as plate tectonics, the phenomenon best described in this simulation here. So here, on Mars at least, the continents don't actually exist or don't flow around, don't interact, and don't create any formations that they do create here on planet Earth. Now one of the best ways of trying to understand how all of this works is this relatively simple simulation, the link for which you can find in the description below, created by the wonderful people from University of Colorado. It actually helps you understand how continental crust works, how the composition and, for example, thickness changes the interaction of the crust with some of the other types of crust, but more importantly, it helps you understand how various plates interact creating various formations. For example, if we have a very thick continental crust right here, and somewhat thinner oceanic crust right here, and the two start to collide forming the convergent plate, at some point a lot of the deposits from the oceanic crust are going to start melting, evaporating, and eventually creating volcanoes on the surface of the continental crust. And those volcanoes are going to create mountains, with the best example being the iconic Mount Fuji in Japan. Then in some other cases, when two continental shelves start to smack into one another, so kind of like this, they'll end up squeezing each other so much that they'll end up producing even more mountain ranges and actually some of the biggest mountain ranges on the planet. The best example of this is the Indian plate squeezing into the Eurasian plate and creating the iconic mountains in the Himalayas, including of course Everest. And so that's the geological basics of planet Earth. A lot of the mountains here are produced in one way or another through the interaction of various plates. And that's of course one of the reasons why we're not going to be finding a lot of similar mountains on other planets, and especially planets that don't have plate tectonics. But I guess the question is, what does life have anything to do with any of this? It's still a geologic process, and it's still something that any planet in theory can have, assuming that it has plate tectonics as well. Well, it turns out that quite a few papers in the last decade or so discovered that one of the main reasons Earth has so many different mountains and such large mountains is because of the existence of graphite that's present in a lot of different shelves, continental shelves, that interact with one another. And so the addition of graphite, or basically carbon, 
into the rock inside different tectonic plates made the rock on the inside a lot more brittle and a lot more likely to stack to go under one another and created the necessary conditions for the plates to do this. But this new study took it a few steps further. They've established a somewhat difficult to ignore correlation between the existence of ancient life and the formation of various mountains on the planet. Specifically identifying a tremendously large formation of mountains around the same time as one of the biggest explosions of life on the planet, during the so-called GOE, Great Oxygenation Event. Implying, of course, that without this ancient life, a lot of mountains on planet Earth might have not even existed at all. And to be more specific, in this study they focused on 20 different mountain ranges around the planet, including, of course, some of the mountains in the Rockies, some of the mountains in South America, the Himalayas, and a lot of other famous mountain formations with specific age of their formation identified in the paper as well. As you see from this image, for example, a lot of these mountain ranges mostly formed between about 2.3 and 1.7 billion years ago, with this graph clearly showing that there was a very, very large and pronounced period of mountain formation right here, about 2 billion years ago, then another one about 1 billion years ago, and then another one about 500 million years ago. In other words, even though you expect mountains to be more or less be created kind of equally across the time scale, in reality a lot of the mountain ranges on the planet were created in bursts and usually around the same time period. Which by itself is already a bit of a mystery. And so the scientists in the study sort of made an assumption. There might have been a source of all of this burst of formation and also at the same time possibly connecting all of this to the presence of graphite that's responsible for making mountains easier to produce. And specifically here the link is between the ancient life and the high amount of carbon being buried in the sediment. All of these tiny ancient organisms that were present all over the oceans approximately two and a half billion years ago especially the organisms that became extremely successful during the Great Oxygenation event, as they essentially sank to the bottom of the oceans, got integrated as carbon into a lot of this ancient sediment, then turned into graphite, which allowed the plates to become a lot more brittle and to slide with a lot more ease. In other words, one of the reasons for the success of plate tectonics on our planet seems to be really because of this organic carbon inside the crust of our planet. And all of this, once again, being a result of ancient life that used to exist on our planet approximately two and a half billion years ago. But the vast majority of these changes, as you can see from this graph, began approximately two billion years ago, which directly correlates with the time when a lot of different plankton and bacteria began to add huge amounts of graphite into the ocean floor, thus becoming sedimented and then moving lower and lower into the Earth's crust. And this graph is important because it shows you when the carbon deposits were actually followed by formation of mountains. And notice how in pretty much every single case, or in most cases, in all of these 20 different mountain ranges, the sedimentation that was basically ancient life depositing as carbon into the plates was almost directly followed by a formation of mountains within about 100 million years. And even the most recent formations of mountains, including the Himalayas, seem to have followed a very similar pattern. In case of the Himalayas, for example, this process of thrusting was actually focused on a lot of the sediments from extremely organic rich beds that were created by a lot of this ancient life. And if correct, this is a huge discovery. It basically implies that the biosphere and the life on our planet is directly responsible for the geology of the planet as well. Or in other words, it establishes a link that nobody knew existed until now. And on top of this, all of the mountain ranges in this case contain huge amounts of graphite that was definitely produced by ancient life. Which of course gives this idea of all of this being biological in nature a little bit more credibility. Although in this case, it's really the presence of ancient marine life. It was the ocean organisms that allowed a lot of these mountains to form millions and even billions of years after their original success on the planet. In other words, another way of looking at this is, well, these are basically the monuments of their success on our planet millions and billions of years ago. But naturally monuments produced by physics, produced by geology, and produced through the interaction of various plates because the life made them slightly more slippery.
But this is of course something that's still happening on our planet today and will continue going on until the plate tectonics finally stop. And interestingly, in terms of the actual composition or at least the percentage of carbon by mass compared to some of the other rocks nearby, it doesn't even require that much carbon. The mountain ranges produced by this effect only required about 10% to maximum about 20% of carbon by mass. All of the mountain ranges investigated in the study only had approximately 10% of graphite by mass with certain mountain ranges having it up to about 20%. And that means that a relatively small amount of biomass is required on a planet in order to produce all of these monuments, all of these mountains. And this is of course really important because one day we might be able to discover something similar on some other exoplanet out there. We might find mountain ranges. And that would be a really interesting sign of potential discovery of historic life on those planets as well. And so, for example, discovering a planet with plate tectonics and, of course, a lot of mountains on the surface is maybe a telltale sign that something similar happened there as well. So, geological formations as signs of potentially successful life in the past is technically a really, really important discovery and something that we can use even in our own solar system. Although, I guess it wouldn't really work on Mars because Mars never really had plate tectonics. But if an object does have some sort of a plate activity, it might help us identify potential life. And so honestly, this is one of the biggest and most surprising discoveries of the year, at least to some extent and at least in geology. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some new discoveries in regards to the magnetic field of planet Earth, and more specifically a discovery of a somewhat unusual and somewhat unexpected cycle that seems to change the magnetic field of our planet every 200 million years, while at the same time changing how the magnetic field seems to flip around the planet. And all of this also explains a few other mysteries, including one of the extinction events that happened a few hundred million years ago, that now the scientists believe very likely happened because of the magnetic field. So let's talk a little bit more about this, starting with the extinction event itself. So roughly around 360 million years ago, and for a period of a few million years, the Earth experienced one of the Big Five extinction events, this one known as the Late Devonian event. But it wasn't just a single event, it was actually several events that happened one after another, with each of them affecting different species and different types of species differently. And one of the more unusual and well-known victims of this extinction event was this strange-looking fish known as Tiktaalik. A fish that sort of looks like a mixture between a fish and a crocodile. And it was very likely one of those fish that learned how to get out of the water and to possibly even walk on land. But what exactly caused these different extinctions during the period of several million years? Well, it seems like there was no one single event or one single source. As a matter of fact, this is one of those somewhat mysterious extinction events that was very difficult to explain until I guess more or less recently. And mostly because of this study and a few other ones that pointed out at something that nobody really noticed before. A lot of the fossils from this period, specifically fossils of various land plants, seem to have a lot of different UV damage, or even mutations caused by ultraviolet radiation. It's as if a lot of these plant spores were somehow damaged by the extremely high doses of UV radiation. And although it might suggest some sort of a supernova event or maybe some sort of a space-related event that might have happened not so far from the planet, a more likely explanation back then was actually the reduction of ozone layer and possibly even the reduction of the magnetic field itself. Which is exactly what some of the recent papers discovered as well. The magnetic field during this period was actually much much lower than today, anywhere from half the strength up to about a quarter of the strength. Which sort of implies that back then Earth was not a very good place to live on, with most likely only deep oceans or maybe some caverns providing enough protection from all of this UV radiation. And specifically, a lot of studies analyzed the levels of mercury and a lot of other components in the fossils to establish that no other major event could have caused the extinction in this case. It could not have been some sort of a space event, and it most likely was not some sort of a volcanic event either. It must have been the sun itself. And interestingly enough, all of this then resulted in a major ice age on the planet. This is sometimes referred to as the Karoo Ice Age. In this case, the loss of the ozone layer might have caused some of these climatic changes. 
But that's not something we're going to be discussing today. What we are discussing is one of these papers that established there seems to be a pattern and also some sort of a cycle planet Earth goes through every 200 million years. And a lot of the results from the study come from the investigation of various rocks and various deposits located right here in Scotland. The paper in the description below provides the actual description for what each of these colors mean and what actual date they represent in the study. But in a nutshell, it represents the era between about 330 million years ago and approximately 416 million years ago. And the first unusual discovery was that the Earth's magnetic field back then was actually much weaker than it is today. Once again confirming that very likely this might have caused the extinction event and all of the damage from the UV light that we're observing in some of the samples. But we also know that the magnetic field and the magnetosphere shifts and changes all the time and even occasionally flips. Generally though, it's believed that in the last 83 million years, the planet went through approximately 180 different reversals or magnetic field flips. There's no actual explanation for why they happen and there's no real understanding behind them, but the samples from various rock deposits confirm that this happened many times, with the average time between flips being about 450,000 years, but the last magnetic flip occurring 780,000 years ago, meaning that we're kind of overdue for the next flip. But if we expand the timeline to several hundred million years, we'll start discovering something else really unusual about the way that the magnetic field behaved in the past. It's a little bit easier to see it on this timeline right here, with the stripes representing the flips. And so if we start going back in time, you'll notice something really unusual happening approximately 83 million years ago. We reach a period when there's actually not a lot of flipping, as a matter of fact, no flipping whatsoever for tens of millions of years. But then it returns to the flipping again. Yet, at the same time, in approximately 200 million years, it reaches the next long period where no flips occur and the magnetic field seems to be pointing in the same direction. We refer to these two events as supercrons, officially defined as a period when the magnetic field does not flip for over 10 million years. And the two most well-known supercrons are referred to as the Cretaceous Normal and Cayman. And well, up until this paper right here, nobody really knew what exactly is happening during those supercrons and why the magnetic field sort of remains constant during that time, and at the same time why the magnetic field flips so much in between supercrons. But the new analysis from various ancient lava flows located in Scotland confirmed the original prediction from approximately 10 years ago. Our planet seems to have a 200 million year cycle when the magnetic field doesn't just flip, it also weakens and strengthens. And when it strengthens, the magnetic field does not flip at all. It creates what we refer to as the supercron, which can sometimes last for several tens of millions of years, which also means that during that period, our planet very likely is completely sheltered from a lot of different space radiation, or at least from the solar radiation and a lot of solar emissions. But in between the supercrons, we get the weakening of the field. And during the weakening, that's when the magnetic field starts to flip back and forth. Now, the actual mechanism is not well understood, but it seems to be directly correlated with the much weaker magnetic field on the planet, which means that by weakening the field, it somehow reduces the stability and forces the inner core to possibly change something on the inside and shift the magnetic field from north to south, from south to north. Now, like I said, we don't really understand the mechanism, but this is what's implied from the paper and from the analysis based on these rocks. And one of the more important discoveries here is the confirmation that whatever happened 330 to 400 million years ago, when the actual magnetic field dipped by quite a lot, seems to also happened exactly 120 million years ago. Once again, suggesting that this is a cyclical event, and it very likely is going to repeat in a few million years from now while at the same time suggesting that right before the supercron, when the magnetic field strengthens and sort of lasts in the same position for a very long time, the magnetic field weakens the most, which also implies that the magnetic field of the planet might start weakening more and more in the next few million years, eventually reaching very low levels like approximately 120 million years ago and approximately 360 million years ago. And so this unusual connection between the strength of the magnetosphere and the magnetic reversals is somewhat unexpected, but also somewhat important. This sort of connects a lot of different events, including the climatic changes, including the extinction events, 
to what seems to be a cyclical nature of the magnetosphere that once in a while seems to become weak enough to make the planet somewhat vulnerable. But naturally, we don't really understand a lot of these effects or what causes any of this. It's of course something related to the conditions and the interaction inside the planet, but what exactly happens we don't really understand. But in the next few years we might come closer to finally answering a lot of these questions and possibly being able to even predict some of these events in the future. For now though, all of this once again shows us how important the magnetic field of the planet is and also how our planet seems to have quite a lot of undiscovered cycles with some cycles being extremely important for the survival of the species on the planet. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some new discoveries in regards to the history of our own planet and how the actual spin of the planet changed in the last um, 80 million years or so. More specifically, I wanted to discuss this new discovery coming from one of the recent papers that suggests that the rotation of the planet, the axis of rotation of the planet, shifted by about 12 degrees before returning back to its original position, and all of this was happening around the time when dinosaurs like T-Rex were considered to be the kings of the planet. They were the apex predators, so roughly around 80 million years ago. Which means that pretty much everything on the surface shifted by about 12 degrees. Which makes this quite an interesting and quite an unusual discovery. But first of all, let's actually discuss some of the differences between various types of changes that our planet goes through once in a while. Mostly because it's relatively easy to make a mistake when it comes to these various concepts in regards to planet Earth and the way it spins. Today we're talking about the concept known as the polar drift. This is when the actual axis of rotation of the planet moves from where it is today, the North Pole, to a completely different location, making the North Pole somewhere entirely different. Which also of course leads to various climatic changes on the surface of the planet. Now that's obviously something we don't really know much about just yet, but we know that the climate does change quite dramatically depending on where the axis of rotation of the planet is. And that's mostly due to the types of surfaces that start to receive solar radiation. But even when it comes to the rotation changes or the actual spin changes of the planet, there are still other concepts that we're not actually discussing today. I think this image right here sort of illustrates this really well. So there's also something known as precession and this is something our planet goes through roughly every 100,000 years or so, or sometimes a little bit less than that. And precession is generally caused by the gravitational effects from the sun and from the moon. But then there is another concept known as mutation where the planet starts wobbling a little bit more. And this is also usually due to various gravitational effects from various bodies around planet Earth. Or actually any other planet as well. With the main difference being that in true polar wonder it's the actual axis that changes on the surface of the planet. Whereas with the precession and with the mutation, the location of the axis does not change on the surface of the planet, but the actual planet's rotation and the actual planet's spin starts to move around and starts to affect the planet that way. And even though in precession, for example, the effects are coming from objects outside of planet Earth, for true polar wonder, the actual effects are coming from within the planet, or at least from the surface. In this case, it usually has something to do with the internal distribution of weight inside the planet. By changing how the mass is distributed on the inside or by essentially reshuffling some of the things on the surface, the axis of the planet starts to shift because the weight is now in different locations. Or in more scientific terms, it basically affects the moment of inertia of the planet itself. And this is generally a really really slow process, with the usual speed of the polar drift being about 1 degree per at least a million years, usually longer. But there is actually a slight mystery in regards to this. Even though the idea of polar drift has existed for a long time and many polar drifts have happened on the planet throughout the ages, it seems that usually the actual axis returns to the original location after a few million years. And so basically here, the axis sort of always returns to a relatively similar spot. And it's not entirely clear why exactly that happens. It's as if something returned the distribution of weight inside the planet back to its original value. With the major explanation essentially suggesting that as the polar drift occurs, some kind of a potential energy is stored inside the continents themselves. But then after a few million years, once the continents become loaded with this potential energy, sort of like a spring or a trampoline, they sort of bounce back and return the axis to its original location on the planet. At least that's the only explanation that we have right now in regards to how all of this works. 
And so let's get back to the original discovery and the original paper that I'm discussing. So first of all, how exactly do the scientists even know any of this happens? Well, a lot of the studies of polar drift usually rely on something known as paleomagnetism. And this technique uses the idea of continental drift. And in simple terms, this is sort of how it works. As two continental plates move away from one another, they essentially create a magnetic polarity record of the entire planet. As the magnetic polarity of the planet reverses from north to south, a lot of the metallic deposits and sediments in these two plates that are moving apart are going to provide the record of where the polarity was and when exactly it changed. And so by studying this for many decades now, the scientists were able to figure out the location of various tectonic plates and also the behavior of the magnetic poles of planet Earth. And because of this, the scientists are pretty sure that in the last 200 million years, the actual axis of rotation shifted back and forth by roughly around 30 degrees or so. But now the scientists are also convinced that there was a very major shift and very unusual shift between about 79 to 86 million years ago when the entire planet tilted by approximately 12 degrees and then returned back to its original location. Which is something that doesn't actually happen that often and doesn't happen that quick usually. This means that the actual axis was moving by about 3 degrees every million years, approximately 3 times faster than all of the other times in history. And so naturally, the question here is what exactly caused this to happen? with one of the possible explanations relating to the idea of continents and continental shelves. And it relates to the Pacific plate that you see right here, the largest tectonic plate on our planet. The scientists suspect that it might have actually been sinking under a different plate 84 million years ago, but then shifted to the west and started moving into the other location, now sinking under a different plate in the west. And so that's of course one of the potential explanations. But the other explanation, which I personally find really intriguing, is in regards to what happens inside the planet. There's also a chance that all of this was caused by what's known as the mantle plumes. The shift and the motion of various hot masses inside the planet itself that might have moved somewhere. Possibly causing something else to change inside the planet as well, and possibly first causing these changes in the axes, but then also causing some other effects on the surface of the planet as well. One of the potential effects here is in regards to what's known as the Deccan Traps. This was a series of really, really powerful volcanoes that lasted for thousands and thousands of years, approximately 10 million years after this. And there's still no actual explanation for what caused the Deccan Traps or why the volcanic eruptions started to begin with. What is pretty clear though is that this event may have played a major role in one of the biggest extinction events on the planet. The event that caused the demise of most of the dinosaurs on the planet. But that's of course something that we can just speculate about because there's really no evidence for any of this. It's just the timeline is really interesting. Nevertheless, what is pretty certain is that the planet definitely changed the location of its axes for roughly around a few million years before it returned back to its original position. And this by itself doesn't really have a good explanation and is actually quite mysterious because it happened so quick, much quicker than any time previously. And because we know these events also very likely happened on objects like Mars, objects like Enceladus, objects like Europa, it's also important to learn about these particular true polar wonders simply to understand how it changes the planet, or in some cases the moon, when the axis of the rotation changes dramatically. At the moment, it's still not a question we can answer very easily. We don't really know. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a really exciting discovery that suggests that the water on the moon, the tiny amounts of water on the moon, are actually created through the interaction with the Earth itself. In other words, the Earth's magnetosphere is responsible for creating quite a lot of water on the surface of this beautiful object. And that discovery sort of shocked the scientists. But let's actually talk a little bit more about this because there is a lot of detail here that we need to discuss. First of all, we know that the origins of water, even on our own planet, is still a bit of a mystery. We're not entirely sure if water came from the asteroids, if it came from some other space source, or if it was already here when the Earth was being made in the beginning of the solar system. What we do know, however, and especially something that we've learned in the last few years, is that water seems to be absolutely everywhere. We've discovered water on moons, we've discovered water on planets, pretty much all of the planets, including some of the hottest and some of the coldest ones. 
and everything from the rings of Saturn to some of the most distant objects in the solar system is basically full of water. So water should not really be that rare and should not be that difficult to find. Not surprisingly, even though originally most scientists believed that moon here was actually extremely dry and basically devoid of water. But in the last few years we've discovered that this was not the case. Here the water was discovered in various ices, ice deposits. It was also discovered in various deposits on the surface in specifically different rocks. And the presence of water hidden in various types of locations on the moon has actually been discovered by many different satellites. Now naturally we're not talking about liquid water, even though it looks blue here, we're talking about water deposits, most likely either ice or possibly some sort of a hydroxyl deposit. But nevertheless, there's a lot of it there, and something is continuously replenishing it. And we know that water shouldn't really stay on the surface of the moon for too long. There's a lot of radiation, there are a lot of interactions with the sun, water should technically be actually evaporating and disappearing. So what's creating this water and what's causing it to remain there for well, basically billions of years? Now one obvious explanation here is maybe it's coming from various asteroids and comets colliding with the moon and eventually depositing that water on the surface. That's quite possible. But in a lot of these locations where water was discovered, it's a little bit difficult to explain all of this with just collisions. Something else must be happening here. Now, a few years ago, actually more like a few decades ago, it was proposed that possibly the sun can be responsible for creating water. And more specifically, the positively charged hydrogen ions coming from the surface of the sun, or basically the solar wind itself, when it actually comes closer to the moon, it will start interacting with various hydroxyl atoms present on the surface of the moon. Hydroxyl is OH, the stuff coming from the sun is H. H plus OH gives you H2O. And so one way that all of this water could have been created is basically by being bombarded by all of the solar wind for billions of years. But if this is correct, there should be an easy way of checking all of this, and there actually should be an easy way to find out if this is really what's happening here. What is that way, Anton, you may ask? Well, magnetosphere. Earth has a very strong magnetosphere that actually prevents the solar wind from basically damaging things on Earth. And we know that Moon once in a while passes through the magnetic tail of our planet, which we can actually try to simulate right here in Universe Sandbox. And for approximately three days, it stays inside the magnetic field of planet Earth, thus protected from the solar wind. During this time, at least theoretically, there should be basically no new water generated because all of the solar wind coming from that location is going to be blocked by the magnetic field of planet Earth. And so one way we can try to measure all of this is by looking at the surface of the moon and trying to see if the amount of water on the surface changed before and after the moon passed through the magneto tail of planet Earth. If the amount of water changed, it means that the solar wind indeed produces a lot of the water. And well, as you can probably guess, that's actually not at all what the scientists discovered and they discovered something that surprised them quite a lot. Because it turns out when the moon finished its passage through the magnetosphere, hill, the amount of water on the moon replenished to the original levels. In other words, the magnetosphere of planet Earth helped the moon produce more water on the surface. Which means that the charged particles inside the magnetic field of planet Earth, and this is of course also positive ions, were landing on the moon, were interacting with the surface of the moon and various hydroxyl molecules, and were also producing even more water which also means that the Earth is actually responsible for producing at least part or possibly even most water we've found so far, with some other water obviously being produced by the Sun as well. So this is actually a huge discovery. This means that, well, stars and also planets can easily influence the production of water on their moons and can possibly even influence the production of water on each other's surfaces. Now, theoretically at least, the scientists actually expected half of the water on the surface here to disappear after those three days. But instead of reducing in value or evaporating as the scientists expected, the amount of water was continuously replenished by the Earth's magnetosphere as well and thus remained relatively similar to what it was before. Which suggests, of course, that both the solar wind and the Earth wind, the wind from Earth's magnetosphere, are more or less both responsible for all of the water we're observing on the surface of the moon. Now all of these observations are actually relatively new and all of this is based on the amazing Chandrayaan-1 mission by India that was already able to create a lot of really precise geologic maps and of course a lot of other interesting maps including the hydrologic map of the moon 
with the main goal for all of this mapping being a, uh, well, essentially a research for the perfect location for a potential lunar base in the future. If we find a location that has a lot of water, a lot of possible minerals and a lot of possible deposits, and a location that possibly has a lot of research value as well, this would most likely become the point where we're going to establish the new colony on the moon. But naturally, for this type of a study, we need a lot of confirmation and a lot of additional observations. And here, one of the possible explanations could be that, well, maybe the water was actually produced by something entirely different, and neither the solar wind nor the Earth's magnetic wind are actually responsible for any of this. Maybe that's why nothing changed. But because a lot of other previous missions have already established that the solar wind does actually interact with the surface of the moon and does actually produce some types of water on the moon, we know that this is most likely not the case. It is most likely actually formed by the solar wind and the magnetic wind from planet Earth. And so in some sense, what the scientists may have just discovered is now known as the water bridge. The bridge from planet Earth to the moon that's creating all of this water on the surface. And what would be super interesting to discover here is how all of this played a role in the formation of water billions of years ago. Because we know, for example, that when the moon was just created approximately four and a half billion years ago, and for the next few billion years, it was extremely close to planet Earth. And it even had a much stronger magnetosphere, which is something we found out and which is something you can learn about in one of the videos above. And because the magnetic field and the magnetosphere seems to be responsible for basically producing all of this water on the surface, it would be interesting to find out if the moon and the earth somehow exchanged all of this water and were somehow responsible for seeding each other or possibly providing each other with a lot of different materials that only existed on one of these objects. In other words, it would be super interesting to find out if both the moon and the earth may have been responsible for exchanging a lot of different ions between one another and creating a lot of different things on each other's surfaces. And here we're talking about all sorts of magnetic particles escaping the upper atmosphere of our planet and back then escaping the surface of the moon and possibly exchanging and interchanging and then eventually depositing on the surface of each of these objects. So basically, this discovery just opened a completely new door for studying the history of the planet and our moon. But at the same time, this also will definitely help us plan the missions better, because now we know the magnetic field of planet Earth has a very different effect on the moon than what we initially thought. Something that a lot of future missions to the moon will definitely have to take into consideration. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about the object known as Theia that approximately four and a half billion years ago collided with planet Earth, eventually resulting in the formation of our beautiful moon. And despite this being a pretty well accepted idea today, there are still a lot of questions about this whole scenario. For example, what happened to the rest of Theia? Did it actually collide and get absorbed into Earth, or did some of it escape into some other area of our solar system? And if so, where exactly is it located today? And so in this video, we're actually going to be discussing a very interesting proposition that makes a lot of sense. Theia is indeed inside our planet Earth, and it actually explains one of the phenomena we have inside our planet that we've discovered a few years ago, but that has since been sort of mysterious and extremely difficult to explain because it does create a lot of really unusual properties on our planet. The objects known as LLSVPs, also known as Large Low Shear Velocity Provinces. But let's go back in time approximately four and a half billion years ago and start with the idea of Theia. So today a lot of scientists believe that Theia was most likely in a very similar orbit to planet Earth for at least a few million years, possibly even 100 million years. It was very likely located right here in the so-called L5 Lagrange point which are the stable orbital points where you can place a satellite, for example, and it's going to stay there without falling into the sun or falling back to planet Earth. And as a matter of fact, several satellites today are in those points. And in these Lagrange points, we also usually discover a lot of different trojans, like the ones that Jupiter has, and so finding a large massive object there is not unusual. But it's still quite easy for an object in a Lagrange point to lose stability and to eventually start moving around the orbit and possibly even collide with one of the other objects. So for example, for satellites, we do need to maintain their orbits to make them stable. And so approximately four and a half billion years ago, the scientists believed that this is exactly what happened to Theia and to planet Earth. 
Theia itself being roughly the same size as planet Mars and Earth being a little bit smaller than it is today, with the impact itself first creating a kind of a disk of debris which then slowly coalesced creating the moon. But this is a somewhat simplified picture and you might already see a problem here. The mass and size of Theia is a lot larger than our own moon. So where's the rest of this object? At the same time, how certain are we that this is exactly how the moon was created? What other proof do we possibly have showing us that this so-called collision occurred approximately 4.5 billion years ago? And even though the direct evidence for this event is a little bit difficult to find, over the past few years scientists did discover a few hints suggesting that this collision did indeed occur, but more importantly that Theia chunks, those leftovers of Theia, are actually still around. And more specifically that those Theia chunks did not disappear, they did not go into the other parts of the solar system, they stayed on planet Earth and sunk to the bottom. And as you probably guessed by now, those chunks are what you see right here on the screen. They are indeed those LSVPs that scientists discovered a few years back. Now in case you don't really know, these LSVPs were discovered by using this technique known as seismic tomography. And the way the technique works is by listening to different earthquake waves and the speed of propagation of those waves, and then comparing the waves forming the overall picture of what the waves most likely pass through. By using this technique, the scientists can usually very accurately see what happens inside planet Earth and also detect various objects that would be otherwise invisible to us. And so by using seismic tomography, long ago the scientists discovered these unusual formations inside our planet. And unfortunately, even today, it's not entirely clear how they were formed. But the original explanation was that they were more likely to be possibly ancient continents that sunk to the bottom of the planet. But that proposition doesn't really explain a lot of things, especially because why is it that these continents sunk but the other ones stayed on the surface? At the same time, several studies that were analyzing volcanic rocks in Iceland identified some of the samples resembling these LSVPs and were able to measure their density, discovering that their density was about 2-3% more dense than mantle of our planet. And obviously, because this stuff is more dense, it would sink to the bottom, depositing on top of the outer core. Interestingly, two of these blobs located beneath Africa have been implicated in the formation of these so-called South Atlantic Anomaly, which is this relatively large magnetic hole present in the region around South America, where the magnetic field becomes so weak that even satellites passing through here do have a tendency to malfunction or even become damaged. And so the scientists today think that this part right here very likely formed because of the LSVPs present in the area right here. So basically we have these very mysterious, dense objects inside our planet whose origin is somewhat difficult to explain. But what is certain about them is that they've been around for a very long time. As I mentioned previously, that study that discovered those rocks in Iceland also discovered that these uh, mantelpieces were extremely old possibly even older than the moon itself. And if we find a piece that's older than the moon, it only suggests one thing. It most likely came from that mysterious Theia. At least that's the implication that the scientists whose paper you can find in a description make after a relatively thorough analysis. The main idea, of course, being the fact that after the moon was born, the chunks of Theia eventually stayed inside our planet and sunk to the bottom forming these LSVPs, and the remnants of Theia are still there today. Which of course would explain why we don't see Theia orbiting somewhere in the solar system, and why we don't actually have any asteroids or any meteorites landing on the planet that might have been from Theia originally. And there's quite a lot of good evidence that the scientists do provide in this paper. So for example, we know that if we were to combine the mass of LSVPs, which is about 2 to maybe 6% of mass of planet Earth, and add them to the mass of the moon, this does give us the average value for the prediction of the total mass of what Theia was probably like as well. At the same time, the predicted value for the density of Theia does actually come really really close to the total value of density we discover inside of those LSVPs. The scientists today believe Theia was slightly denser, possibly about 2-3% denser than planet Earth. And so the explanation presented in the paper is that, well, once you combine Theia and the early Earth, you'll get these chunks of Theia stuck inside of the mantle of planet Earth, which will eventually solidify and form the regions that do resemble LSVPs 
that we find on the bottom of the mantle of our planet. And because denser material usually sinks to the bottom, that's basically why the LSVPs were formed. Theia's mantle was just denser to begin with. With these pieces here representing some sort of an iron-rich and possibly highly dense mantle, slightly more iron-rich than the mantle of planet Earth. And all of this also connects to a lot of other discoveries that suggested that these really ancient LSVPs have approximately a similar age to the original impact with Theia, with all of these studies together now giving us a pretty clear picture of what probably happened about 4.5 billion years ago. So let's try to summarize. We had two objects in the same orbit, with one of the objects becoming destabilized and eventually colliding with planet Earth. With the collision itself creating quite a lot of debris orbiting around the planet, with the other parts eventually settling inside the mantle. The debris on the outside solidified and created our beautiful moon. But the pieces on the inside were much denser and eventually sunk to the bottom of the mantle, forming what we know today as LLSVPs. The mysterious, dense and extremely massive pieces of planet Earth that is otherwise difficult to explain. The total mass here is between 2 to 6% the mass of planet Earth. And overall, this explanation actually does solve a lot of different mysteries we've had about our own planet. But whether this is a correct explanation or whether some other explanation is going to be provided in the future, well, only time will show. For now, honestly, this is actually pretty brilliant and explains quite a lot. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about magnetic reversals. And here we're actually talking about this one particular study that came out not so long ago that suggests something really horrible happened to our planet approximately 42,000 years ago, during the period that sometimes is referred to as the Adams period, or Adams transitional event, named after the science fiction writer Douglas Adams, who famously had this thing about the number 42. 42 was the answer to everything. But despite this being a somewhat cute reference to this event, it may have actually caused serious disruptions on our planet, including several extinction events. As a matter of fact, this paper also suggests that the extinction events on our planet, including the extinctions of Neanderthals and a lot of other species on the planet, might have been correlated with this event that's definitely going to happen again. So let's talk about this and let's discuss what exactly happened 42,000 years ago. And as you might have already guessed from the title of the video, all of this relates to the magnetic poles of our planet. Here we're talking about the occasional magnetic reversals when the North Pole becomes the South Pole, that is the magnetic North becomes the magnetic South, and vice versa. For example, in one of the previous videos, we've talked about this simulation that established that during the reversal, a lot of really hectic things happened to our planet, resulting in the magnetosphere that's not really that strong. This lasts for anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand years, and after this, the poles become reversed and the South becomes the North. There are actually a lot of studies analyzing these reversal events uh, from the past, and we've already established that they do happen roughly around every 300,000 years or so, but they're also kind of random in some way. So in that sense, we kind of overdue for the next event, and technically it should have happened a few hundred thousand years ago, but since we have no idea how the mechanism of these events works and what exactly causes them, well, we cannot really predict the next one. But the reversal events are actually slightly different from the excursion events. Excursion events are a lot more frequent. Unlike a magnetic reversal, an excursion event is usually temporary and it essentially results in the sudden weakening of the magnetic field with even more chaos and a lot more unpredictable variation of magnetic lines where suddenly things become very different from how they were for thousands and thousands of years. This can last, once again, anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand years, but in the end results in the magnetic fields returning back to where they were. The magnetic north is still the same magnetic north. But as I mentioned, the magnetic excursion events are a lot more frequent. And the last such event to happen, the one that we studied quite a lot, is known as the La Champ excursion event or simply La Champ event. The unusual event that started about 42 to maybe 43,000 years ago that suddenly lowered the magnetic field of our planet for roughly around 400 years or possibly as long as a thousand years. This simulation you see right here shows you in pink and in red colors how the magnetic field was lowered in certain regions of the planet and how it then strengthened after just a few thousand years. 
Now this particular event is really interesting because it's definitely one of the most studied uh, magnetic events on our planet and it's also the one that's the most easy to study. We have a lot of different sources available including rocks and including different deposits but also trees and specifically different types of trees that have actually preserved a lot of information in terms of collecting data of carbon-14 and beryllium-10 presence which normally is correlated with higher radiations on the planet. Now here's the thing though. We know that this event definitely happened and we know that this event affected certain parts of the planet more than others. This simulation here actually presents this quite accurately. Certain regions were not as affected, but certain regions in Europe and regions in Australia and New Zealand were affected quite a lot. So in other words, this wasn't really a true reversal, this was an excursion event when the magnetic lines weakened, creating the conditions where the entire magnetosphere of the planet was about 5-10% to the total strength that we have today. And this lasted for several centuries. Now naturally, if something like this were to happen today, we would be in a lot of trouble. And we do have a lot of similar examples of this happening on Earth already. For example, here's the image taken by ESA last year that shows us this relatively large hole, you could call it, although technically it's known as the South Atlantic Anomaly, that represents a relatively weakened magnetic field that does affect certain objects in orbit of our planet. And the best example of how this affects satellites is from the Hitomi spacecraft that was used by the Japanese Space Agency for several years until it started experiencing unusual glitches after passing through the anomaly several times. And this basically, at least unofficially, destroyed the satellite over time. So we know that without the magnetic field to protect our planet, the satellite technology and a lot of aerospace related industries are going to be basically impossible to maintain. Even flying in an airplane is going to become extremely dangerous. And so this magnetic anomaly is a really good example for how dangerous all of this can be if one day another excursion starts to occur. But what exactly happened 42,000 years ago? Well the reason this event is known as the La Champ excursion is actually because of the place where the original signs of it were discovered. This was in a place called Clermont Ferrand in France. And it was actually a discovery of different deposits in lava rock that allowed the scientists to study the strength of magnetosphere for essentially several hundred years during that period. But another recent discovery came from another region on the planet using something entirely different, using very ancient trees from New Zealand. The trees that you see right here are known as the Kauri. And there's quite a lot of them that have been preserved in ancient bogs from New Zealand that allow us to basically make a cross-section and then find out what was happening to those trees during that period by studying each individual ring. Some of these trees are actually really ancient and some of them grow to be gigantic. So they're basically a perfect specimen for studying what was happening during those periods. And just as expected, the trees did contain elevated levels of carbon-14 and beryllium-10, indicating that a lot of radiation was reaching our planet, and these trees were essentially bombarded by a tremendous amount of ultraviolet light, tremendous amount of radiation in general, for hundreds and hundreds of years, for over 400 years actually. And although previous studies that used ice cores from Greenland that were around the same age, didn't actually discover anything specific or unusual about the climate during those periods, this once again can be actually explained through the idea of excursions being somewhat localized in how they affect the planet. Certain regions do not get affected as much as other regions. And because of this, certain regions become more climatically affected by certain things than, for example, a region that's on the other side of the planet. But the question is, of course, how did this really affect the planet? And this is where the scientists in this paper look at some of the other events that may have happened around this time and essentially correlate this with several major events that did occur around the same region around the same time. Specifically, the sudden disappearance of megafauna. A large amount of Australian megafauna, or essentially these really large animals that used to exist in Australia and New Zealand, more or less suddenly vanished around the same time. Sometimes it's actually quoted as around 46,000 years ago, but certain studies discover it to be closer to about 42,000 years ago. Now naturally this is a correlation, not a causation, but a very interesting correlation nevertheless. It has been actually speculated that maybe it was the result of human overhunting them, but the disappearance was extremely sudden, and it's also assumed that humans have arrived to this region about 10,000 years prior to their disappearance, so it wouldn't really make sense. 
But what's even more interesting is that the implication in this paper is that the excursion was also probably responsible for the extinction of our cousins, the Neanderthals. We know that the Neanderthals also have suddenly gone extinct roughly around 40,000 years ago. Now, it previously has been implied that this was maybe a result of a some sort of a competition with humans, basically with us, but the proof for this was never really there. As a matter of fact, in the last couple of years, pretty much most of the studies started to imply that the Neanderthals have actually gone extinct because of the climate change. And this paper specifically makes a very strong case for it. Correlating the excursion event and the various effects that it might have created on the planet with the extinction of Neanderthals and a lot of other species on the planet. And so this of course implies that the excursion event had some major biological effects on the biosphere of our planet. A lot of species might have actually not survived the event, and species that did survive it might have been affected by it in some other ways. But the most interesting correlation that they present in this paper is something that actually kind of surprised me. It's in regards to what happened to us. They actually discovered that Around the same time, our ancestors started to create a lot of these really interesting cave paintings using this very unusual red dye known as the red ochre. It actually did appear very suddenly around this time, around 42,000 years ago, and was found to be displayed in various caves around the planet. It just so happens that the modern humans still use red ochre for something here on the planet. It's actually used as a kind of a sunscreen by certain tribes in Africa. The actual name is Ojizi, oh, which is exactly what it's called, probably not. Anyway, that's what a lot of tribes in Namibia still use today to protect themselves from the dangerous effects of the sun and from basically being burned by the ultraviolet radiation. And you might kind of already see where I'm going with this. It looks like 42,000 years ago, when the magnetic field weakened and when a lot of radiation started to reach our planet, and very likely also started to decrease the ozone layer as well, the amount of UV light on the planet also increased dramatically. This obviously would cause things to burn pretty easily. UV light is pretty damaging to a lot of different cells. And because of this, maybe ancient humans discovered the secret weapon. The ability to protect themselves from the UV light, which allowed them to kind of survive and to thrive afterwards. We don't really know if this is exactly what happened, but it is kind of implied in the study. But because the atmosphere was so ionized, it also very likely changed the climate completely. There was a lot of lightning, a lot of storms, a lot of different conditions that simply do not exist today, so the entire night skies probably looked very different from how it is today. And for all we know, maybe because of all of these crazy conditions outside, including lightning strikes, very very powerful sun, and a lot of radiation coming from everywhere, the humans decided to stick around the caves a lot more frequently, thus allowing them to basically create these paintings that we later found. None of this is of course a fact yet, but the implications coming from the study and the analysis performed in the study are nevertheless very very interesting. But that's all cool and all, how does it actually affect us? Well, it just so happens that we don't really know when the next excursion is going to happen. Some people have already started to speculate that we're sort of headed there. As a matter of fact, if you look at the total strength of the magnetic field, it looks like it kind of weakened in the last century or so. It actually is about 10% weaker than it was roughly around 200 years ago. At the same time, we have this new thing going on with the magnetic north suddenly moving extremely fast. So fast, as a matter of fact, that the scientists had to recalculate their previous assumption about how fast it's moving. You can actually see this right here with the modeled prediction versus the observed motion of the magnetic field showing us how far and how quickly it has already moved just in these five years. There's currently no actual explanation for what's happening with the magnetic north, but some people have already implied that maybe this is what's going to happen in the next few hundreds of years. Maybe, just maybe, we are actually headed toward an excursion event. And if we are to learn anything from the past, from the event 42,000 years ago, and also from the effects we've already observed with the anomaly in the south that has already destroyed at least one satellite, this is something that we might want to kind of start preparing for, just in case. We don't really know if this is exactly what's happening or if it's going to affect us in any way, but it would probably kind of help us to be a little bit more prudent. We know that the magnetic field is essential for our planet, so the sudden decrease in the magnetic field might actually affect us quite a lot. Luckily for us, 
we already have several different papers also suggesting how we can potentially create artificial magnetic field. There are a lot of different things we know about the Moon, there are a lot of different things we know about our Earth, and we've also discovered a lot of different effects one object has on the other. Hello wonderful person, today we're going to be talking about yet another really interesting discovery that tells us more about the effects our Moon has on planet Earth approximately once a month for about 3 days or so. The effects that we kind of expected, but nobody really knew exactly what it does until the scientists were able to measure them. And here we're going to be talking about something that we can refer to as the lunar tail. The beautiful tail that's formed by various effects from the sun and that Earth passes through every single month and stays in it for about 3 days or so. Which also of course connects to several other studies I've discussed in some of the previous videos that should be popping up somewhere above me at some point, with one of the more interesting studies that even suggested that the flow of oxygen ions from planet Earth seem to even encourage the creation of water on the surface of the Moon, or implying that these tails are very influential on the objects as they pass through these tails once in a while. But I guess the first question is, well, how are these tails even formed? Well, as this NASA video shows, it's really through the interaction with the Sun and specifically the very highly charged particles coming from the Sun. They sort of wrap around the planet or around the Moon and end up creating this beautiful charged tail that's visible around many different objects, including in this case Venus, or as you might have learned from the slightly younger Anton right here, from the video above, it also seems to appear around Mercury and is easily visible assuming you have the right filter. Alright, this sort of looks weird, there's like two of me and both of me are talking about similar but different things. Let's go back to the idea of tails. So all objects seem to produce them because the Sun kind of makes them because of the interaction of different charged particles. Their content though depends on what's being emitted. So for example for Venus it's mostly stuff from the atmosphere. For Earth it's also mostly stuff from the atmosphere and in this case it's a lot of oxygen. But for the Moon, because there is no atmosphere, something else must be happening here. And that something else is of course little particles from the surface usually disturbed by various micrometeorites and essentially what you would refer to as the exosphere. There's this famous image from NASA from the Apollo missions that shows us the lunar horizon glow and this really sort of illuminates this tiny tiny exosphere or this really thin atmosphere that exists around the Moon and also exists around most other objects in the solar system. Now in this case the actual content of it is presently unknown but different molecules have already been detected over the past few decades. There seems to be a little bit of oxygen, a little bit of helium, a little bit of argon, also things like methane, nitrogen, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, but also large amounts of sodium and potassium. And it's really the sodium that we're kind of interested in. Just like in the video about mercury, it's very likely the sodium tail that seems to reach all the way to Earth and produces the most observable effects we're seeing from planet Earth. Although it's very possible that a lot of other elements are also present here as well. But where is all of the sodium coming from? Well actually from the same location or from the same source as we find in the region in the upper atmosphere of our planet known as the sodium layer. And sodium layer is easily visible in this picture from NASA because it forms this obvious yellow orangey line that wraps all around the planet. And all of this is made of various matter coming from outer space, specifically meteorites and micrometeorites that burn up in the upper atmosphere and leave behind a lot of sodium that then starts to produce a lot of this orangey glow because of the illumination from the sun. But all of these micrometeorites and asteroids also end up on the moon. And since there is no atmosphere, they end up colliding producing a lot of different tiny collisions on the surface, dislodging a lot of different particles from the surface, which then eventually results in this. And because there's a lot of electrostatic on the surface of the Moon and a lot of different electromagnetic effects that sort of make this float and circulate above the surface of the Moon, it all ends up sort of hanging there until the solar radiation comes in, bombards the surface of the Moon and dislodges all of these electrostatically charged particles. And so once all of this stuff starts to leave the Moon, it creates the tail behind it. And the tail itself is really large. And obviously, once in a while, Earth passes through it. 
but it seems that for the most part all of these particles from this tail end up sort of circulating around the planet with some also ending up in the sodium layer of planet earth but the vast majority of the particles simply leave the planet on the other side escaping into the interplanetary space which also means that all of these particles coming from the moon are definitely harmless and generally have almost no effect on our planet at all However, every month for a few days, the glow does become visible to some really highly powered telescopes that usually start reporting very faint orange glow in the skies, which also seems to occasionally increase in power. Although for the most part, it sort of looks like this. This is almost exactly what the scientists usually see. It's this really fuzzy spot, usually on the other side from the sun, and is normally about 5 times larger than the moon is in the night skies, but about 50 times dimmer than the light that the human eye can perceive. So you do need to have a special telescope to be able to detect this. And because its brightness seems to fluctuate from time to time, the scientists really wanted to find out what's really going on here. How come the brightness changes? Is it because of the solar cycles? Is it because of the differences in orbit as the moon orbits around the Earth? Or does it have something to do with the Earth's atmosphere? And so the scientists whose paper you can find in the description analyzed approximately 21,000 photos from about 13 years of different observations in order to discover any possible patterns and any possible explanations to why this particular sodium tail varied from time to time. So for example, one of the obvious discoveries was that the spot was a little bit brighter when the moon was a little bit closer to planet Earth. That kind of makes sense. You know, it's coming from the moon, so obviously the closer the moon is, the more effects we'll see. It also seems to peak and be the brightest when the moon is what's known as the new moon. And so about 5 hours after the new moon, that's when the sodium tail seems to be at the brightest possible. And that's of course because of the orbital locations here, with the sun being almost exactly behind the moon and blasting it with a lot of energy that's creating all these particles headed toward planet Earth. But surprisingly, there was absolutely no correlation with the solar activity, including the solar cycle. No matter how active or inactive the sun was, the power of the tail and the brightness of the tail didn't change almost at all. And so the tail seems to be a natural formation independent of how much energy the sun is emitting toward us. There was also no correlation with any other solar effects such as, for example, electron pressure, helium pressure, density or speed of plasma in the interplanetary space and so for the most part the effect was always there and was always more or less permanent. But it did have one interesting pattern that was somewhat related to what was happening on the surface of the moon. It seems that there is a kind of a pattern every four years, a pattern that's related to various collisions happening on the surface of the moon. Okay, so this particular simulation is actually a little bit exaggerated. Here we're talking about micrometeorites. But every four years, the Moon and planet Earth experience an increase in micrometeorite collisions. This is a more or less sporadic event that happens as both Earth and Moon orbit around the solar system. And it's not really related to any specific meteor shower or asteroid shower or any other specific event. But these random encounters and these sporadic events do seem to contribute the most to the overall brightness of this sodium tail. With the most reasonable explanation being that, well, unlike a typical meteor shower, an occasional collision with a slightly larger meteorite is more likely to release a lot more material into the exosphere and thus create a much brighter tail as a result. And if a large enough collision occurs and a large enough asteroid ends up colliding with the moon, it might even produce such a tremendously powerful tail that is going to be easily visible with a naked eye looking into the night skies. Now it's not something that has happened just yet and it's not something that we expect to happen anytime soon, but based on the idea of the exosphere on the moon and how we believe it's formed, a large enough strike on the moon will definitely be enough to produce observable effects that are going to be easily visible as a really bright sodium tail emanating through the night skies approximately five times larger than the full moon. And this type of glow might have happened in the past and might have even surprised certain early astronomers, but they probably had absolutely no idea what they were looking at. But if it happens in the future, we'll know exactly how to analyze it and what to look for. So in some sense, I secretly hope something does collide with the moon sometime soon. But anyway, on that note, it's definitely a very interesting discovery it's still not entirely clear if this has any other effect on the planet Earth other than just the visual effects, but chances are we might discover more about this in the next few years.
Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to talk about how lightning might have had a very important role in helping life start on early Earth, and also discuss the idea of how lightning changes the chemical composition of a planet over millions and billions of years. But to start we have to go back in time about 4.5 to 3.5 billion years ago. It was a lot more inhospitable to life, and looked extremely different from anything we have on the surface today. But then within only a few million years, it most likely also started to acquire a lot of water on the surface, and at some point might have even turned from this into some sort of a wonderful water world, with very likely no surface showing whatsoever. But then sometime around 3.7 to maybe about 4 billion years ago, first life started to appear on the planet and continuously evolved for billions of years afterwards. But in order to form all of this early life, a lot of very specific elements had to be present on the surface, and we're still trying to figure out how some of these elements made it to the surface. Although the assumption today is that most of this material was probably brought to Earth through various collisions for billions and billions of years. Now this makes a lot of sense uh, for most materials, but some elements are still very difficult to explain if it was really only asteroid collisions. Especially because about 3.5 to 3.7 billion years ago when life began on Earth, generally speaking there weren't really that many collisions compared to, for example, the late heavy bombardment, which occurred a few hundred million years prior to this. And there's one specific element that the scientists are particularly curious about, or at least where it really came from, and that's the element known as phosphorus. The origins of element phosphorus are extremely important to understand because pretty much everything related to life on Earth uses phosphorus to some extent. For example, phosphorus plays an extremely important role in the structure of both RNA and DNA molecules, essentially representing the structure or the structural framework of the molecule itself while at the same time, pretty much most of the energy inside our cells uses what's known as ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, which is in some sense often referred to in biology as the molecular basic unit of energy transfer. And the P in ATP stands for phosphorus, so it does play a really important role in the formation of this particular molecule. Not to mention that phosphorylation reaction itself is an extremely important reaction in biology, and even if you were to look at the structure of the cell itself, the cell wall is made of what's known as the phospholipid, and the phospho in the phospholipid is once again phosphorus. And so in that sense, no matter where you look in our bodies or really any part of the body of any living being on the planet, you'll always find some need for phosphorus. And even our bodies, human bodies, contain about 700 grams of phosphorus in them, with the vast majority being inside our bones, about 85-90%. to 90%. But the question is of course, where did it come from originally? How was it created on early planet in order to be integrated into the life we have today? Now all of the early explanations did involve asteroids, but as I mentioned previously, this explanation is not really that satisfactory. As a matter of fact, there is a slight discrepancy between how much phosphorus we expect on the planet to be delivered from asteroids and the actual amount we find on the surface. So there might have been something else going on here, especially because early Earth was definitely very different from the modern Earth. And so the scientists whose paper you can find in the description below propose a pretty brilliant explanation, and an explanation that actually makes a lot of sense. They believe that it was made by lightning, a lot of lightning strikes on the early planet. And we're not just talking about million or even billion lightning strikes, we're talking about quintillion lightning strikes that occurred in the first billion years or so. And back then there were a lot more lightning strikes than we have today. And today, we still have quite a lot. There's approximately 500 million lightning strikes per year. And this map from NASA kind of shows you the frequency map of the average lightning flashes on the planet, with a lot of lightning strikes being concentrated in the more tropical areas. There are actually so many lightning strikes that they even produce a kind of an electric hum in the atmosphere of our planet, known as the Schumann Resonance. We will talk about this in one of the future videos, so make sure to subscribe because that video is coming in the future. But the estimates suggest that early Earth might have experienced up to about 5 billion lightning strikes, with at least a billion hitting the planet's surface. And it is actually a really cool example we have for the planet today of what happens to the surface of the planet when the lightning strikes hits. What you're looking at right here is known as a fulgurite, and this is what happens when the lightning hits the surface of the Earth. Fulgurites are a pretty well-known phenomenon, and there's actually quite a lot of them all over the place, and normally they kind of look like these tubes you see on the right. And so in a nutshell, this is actually a type of a glass that's produced in extremely high voltage environments. 
And depending on where the lightning strikes, like for example in this case this was a sand fulgurite, they will contain different materials on the inside, but their shape is generally going to be like this long tube because of the actual shape of the lightning. And generally speaking, today the scientists know that some of the useful phosphorus on the planet was originally delivered to the planet by various meteorites that could have been rich in phosphorus, like this one right here, with the material on the inside known as Schreibersite. This contains a lot of metal, but it also contains phosphorus, and if heated enough, especially during a collision with planet Earth, some of this phosphorus could be released and become useful for life development. However, the scientists in the study discovered that similar material can also be produced when a lightning strikes certain types of clays. And so in this case, imagine an early Earth environment where there is a lot of clay near some sort of a lake or an ancient ocean. A sudden lightning strike of this location will create enough conditions here to suddenly change all of this phosphorus on the inside, making it more useful for life. As a matter of fact, it might even create some other components that are necessary for life. With all of this material then getting released and combining with other stuff to create a lot of bioavailable phosphorus. And possibly also a lot of other compounds, thus creating the conditions necessary for early life to start developing. And if a lot of these lightning strikes started to hit the part of the planet where there was a lot of clay very close to the water, all of this would create perfect conditions for life to suddenly begin and to start evolving. There will be a tremendous amount of new materials for life to use and to start developing RNA, DNA and of course all of the other structures that today use phosphorus to some extent. Now because this is just the first paper and obviously more investigations and more um, analysis is needed, but if the authors of this paper are correct, it means that we might have a new signal and something else to look for out there if we are trying to find life somewhere else in the universe. In this case, we need to look for planets that either had or have a lot of lightning on the surface. Because according to this paper, lightning is essential to the creation of life, at least early life, and to the formation of certain molecules that would be otherwise very difficult to form. And because eventually, with better telescopes, we should be able to observe both the presence of phosphorus and of course the presence of lightning strikes, it might even help us discover life somewhere out there by just using this particular technique. And since according to the scientists in this paper, anywhere from 100 kilograms to possibly even 10 tons of phosphorus and other compounds similar to phosphorus could be produced by lightning strikes every single year on one of these planets, it means that over millions and billions of years, a tremendous amount of different compounds is produced in this way. And so if we do find planets with a lot of lightning strikes on them, and if those planets also exhibit signs of phosphorus in the atmosphere, we might actually have a really good chance to find some sort of a life on those planets. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing this somewhat mysterious phenomenon that we actually know very little about, known as the Milky Sea, sometimes also known as the Mareel. A phenomenon that's connected to bioluminescence, a glowing of living organisms. But in this case, it's on a scale that's never been seen before, covering hundreds and hundreds of square kilometers, literally turning an entire patch of ocean into this glowing sea, sea on fire. Which is exactly what Mario means as well. It means sea of fire. And so today we're going to be focusing on this recent paper that was able to finally use satellite data to investigate and to prove that these particular phenomena do exist and even learn some of the details of where they usually happen, how big they get and how often we can expect them every single year. But I guess first let's start right here. If you've traveled to some of the more tropical areas and if you visited certain regions on the planet, you might have actually seen this, the bioluminescent waves that sometimes also make surfing quite an interesting experience. And we actually know pretty well how this is formed, but this is not exactly the same phenomenon. In this case, the bioluminescence is caused by these very tiny dinoflagellate organisms, organisms that might look something like this under the microscope, that tend to produce bioluminescence if they are disturbed by something physical. Like for example, if you were to move through the water, or if the waves were to crash onto the beach, this would essentially result in the sudden creation of light in that particular region. But the Milky Sea seems to be an entirely different phenomenon. All of the data collected from satellites over the past few decades does suggest that this actually happens entirely free of any disturbance. The ocean itself or the sea itself starts to kind of glow for many many days and sometimes even weeks. Which of course suggests that even though these phenomena are related, they are entirely different. 
On top of this, unlike this bioluminescence that's pretty well known and pretty well documented, the Milky Sea phenomenon was actually seen as a potential hoax or potentially just a legend. Or in other words, like many other sea legends, it was believed to be something that someone made up. How can an entire ocean, an entire sea, glow in the dark and produce a lot of light? But back in 2005, for the first time ever, these scientists have officially proved this phenomenon through essentially a photographic evidence from a satellite. And so what used to be a legend now became a scientific fact. The next step became figuring this out. How does it work? Who creates this? And what else is happening here that we don't really understand? Well, it's been about 16 years now and we still know very little about this particular phenomenon. In general though, we understand quite a lot about bioluminescence. And here's a fun fact. Bioluminescence or glowing in different animals has independently evolved 40 different times. In other words, it seems to be an extremely successful strategy. And it's used for various reasons. It's used for communication, it's used as camouflage, it's used to attract food, it's used to attract mates, it's also used to scare away potential predators, and it's also obviously used for a lot of other reasons, such as just attracting your food. But pretty much all of these organisms seem to employ a relatively similar strategy, even though usually it produces different types of light. They seem to use this component or this compound known as luciferin, with the compound itself resembling something like this. Now obviously it differs a little bit from species to species, but generally this compound involves a chemical reaction, usually with oxygen, which essentially excites the molecule and then when it goes back to its ground state, it releases a photon of light. And depending on the compound and the enzyme used, it will produce a slightly different color. But unlike some of the other types of marine bioluminescence, such as the one seen in fish, such as the one seen in jellyfish or dinoflagellates, whatever is produced during the milk sea phenomenon is bright enough to be visible from space, which is of course something that is really difficult to explain right now. It also seems to produce a somewhat steady uniform light that does not actually depend on the disturbance or any other features of the ocean. And whatever is causing it seems to stay this way for a very long time. As a matter of fact, some of the previous mariners compared this to a kind of a glowing snowfield that expands all the way to the horizon, with the light produced being somewhat bluish white in color. So somewhat different from the one we observe in some of the other marine organisms. But interestingly enough, back in 1988, even before the confirmation using satellite data, at least one research vessel accidentally passed through the Milky Seas phenomenon. And back then the scientists were able to collect some of the samples from the water. You can read more about this from the paper right here. But back then the assumption was that a lot of this bioluminescence is most likely caused by this bacterium present in the water. Bacterium known as the Vibrio harvey. But this encounter only happened once, and because of this, nobody could confirm this, and since then nobody really knew what's really happening here. More importantly, it would be extremely difficult to explain why so much of this bacterium seems to accumulate in certain areas of the world. So one of the major discoveries from this recent study is actually pinpointing the exact locations where we seem to have the most of these milky seas. A lot of them happen in the regions you see right here either in the Indian Ocean close to the Arabian Sea, in between islands in Indonesia north of Australia, or in some cases near Sri Lanka, with the vast majority happening in the Indian Ocean. And interestingly enough, from all the observations in the last hundred or so years, the scientists established that this happens at least three times a year. But unfortunately, somewhat unpredictably, there doesn't seem to be any seasonal pattern or seasonal correlation. At the same time, all of the recent data from the satellites in the last 12 years or so establish that these phenomena seem to be relatively regular. They also seem to cover extremely large areas, up to about 100,000 square kilometers. And as I mentioned before, they also seem to persist for days and sometimes weeks. So hypothetically, it should be possible to maybe reach these locations to study them further. But at the moment, it has not been done just yet. But one of the main reasons why a lot of new data is available now and a lot of new data allows us to prove that this phenomenon actually does exist is because of this NASA mission known as the Suomi National Polar Orbiting Partnership with a satellite that uses VIRS, which stands for Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometry Suite, which allows the satellite to detect extremely minute emissions of light, which allows the satellite to detect a lot of things about our oceans. One of the main missions here is measurements of chlorophyll and the oxygen-producing organisms in our oceans. You can actually access a lot of this data yourself 
by going to this website here and choosing one of these links to data access. For example, this one here allows you to go back in time and see what our planet looked like in the last nine years or so. So all the way back to January of 2012. And here by going through different periods, you might be able to zoom in and then see what the oceans and the distribution of chlorophyll looked like. But then by choosing the nighttime data here and possibly going through some of the dates in the past, you could hypothetically maybe discover some of the other bioluminescent phenomena that might have been missed by these scientists. Now, personally, I haven't tried this myself because there are a lot of different pictures out there, but in theory, it's definitely possible. And because of this extremely sensitive NASA satellite, the nighttime data from around the planet allowed the scientists to identify at least 12 different instances of this phenomenon in the last nine years. But what became more clear is that these phenomena seem to be somehow connected to the monsoon season, at least in the Indian Ocean. Which means that in this particular region, it could be connected to the sudden enrichment of water in various nutrients delivered by the monsoons. However, this did not apply to all of the regions. In some of the regions, right now it just looks completely random. Although it could obviously be still connected to the nutrition being brought to the water, with nutrient-rich waters obviously coming from something entirely different. Moreover, it was discovered that the actual glow seems to be extremely steady, no matter the conditions of the ocean, even if there's a storm or if the water is completely still. And the actual glow seems to be mixed throughout the water, it's not just the surface glow. Suggesting that the organisms responsible for the glow are not just on the surface, but also seem to be slightly deeper in the water as well. And so altogether this paper provides a lot of exciting discoveries, but unfortunately pretty much no answers. We still have no idea what produces this, or more importantly for what reason, and we still have absolutely no idea if this is caused by the bacteria discovered back in 1985, and if so, why so much of this bacteria is present in those regions. So quite a lot of unanswered questions and quite a lot of mystery even now. More importantly though, this study finally allows us to confirm the largest bioluminescence phenomenon on the planet. The phenomenon that happens at least three times a year and seems to be extremely large in size. Hundreds of thousands of square kilometers covering an area equivalent to a small country. And so hopefully in the next few years, at least some of the scientists will be able to catch this phenomenon firsthand with this particular area in the North Indian Ocean possibly presenting the best opportunity to finally catch this and to finally analyze the water samples from this region. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about the future, the distant future, of planet Earth. And more specifically, the transformation of the continental crust as the continents move around the planet and eventually transform our planet into something very different from what it is today. Something that will not just change the visual appearance of the planet, but will also dramatically affect the climate on the surface as well. And today we'll talk about one such investigation that managed to simulate what Earth might look like in the next 200 to 300 million years in the future, and how all of this will most likely change the climate as well. And all of this is of course based on the idea of plate tectonics, something that a lot of us have probably learned earlier in school, and also something that you can learn more about by watching this NASA video that I posted in the description below. You can also check out this beautiful website created by Ian Webster that shows you the simulation of what Earth may have looked like throughout the period of about 800 million years in the past, and also look at some of the most important moments in the history of planet Earth as the plate tectonics changed the shape of our planet. But the most important part to all of this is that once in a while Earth seems to form these supercontinents, with the most uh, famous one probably being the Pangaea supercontinent that existed about 240 million years ago. This is essentially when all of the continents sort of merged into one large supercontinent, with the rest of the planet forming an extremely large ocean. Now we're not entirely sure why this happens and also why this is something that happens quite a lot, but usually this also leads to a breakup of the supercontinent into smaller continents, which eventually forms something that looks similar to Earth today. And by studying the geology of our planet, we've discovered that this whole supercontinent thing happened a few times. Prior to Pangaea, there was another supercontinent known as Panutia roughly around 600 million years ago. This one was actually relatively short-lived, and it was actually created from a larger and much longer living supercontinent known as Rodinia that existed for several hundred million years, and most likely began forming about one billion years ago. 
But interestingly, prior to this, about 1.5 billion years ago, there was another supercontinent that we refer to as Nuna or Columbia. So there's a kind of a cyclical nature to them and they do seem to happen every few hundred million years. And with the last one being about 200 million years ago, the next one will probably happen in approximately 200 million years from now. Here's a general time frame of each of these supercontinents as they appeared on the surface of our planet. Now, the actual reasons for this are not entirely clearly understood just yet, but most scientists believe that it has something to do with the repetitive patterns due to the convection inside our planet. Today you understand that there's a lot of this kind of a circular motion going on inside our planet, known as convection, that's essentially due to the heat distribution inside the planet. As the mantle here rises, usually the continents start drifting apart, and as the mantle starts descending, that's when the continents start moving closer together. But once in a while, as the continental crust starts to accumulate and starts to sink in one region of the planet, it starts creating a lot of these plumes, or super plumes as they're known, that essentially push the continents away from other regions on the planet and move them closer and closer to that one region where all of the continents are already formed. And this happens once in a while, this is a very cyclical process, but it's obviously not a permanent process because these continents do eventually break up. But there's one important feature of supercontinents, or continents in general, that I haven't really mentioned yet. It's in regards to the transport of heat around the planet due to various motions of, well, really the oceanic currents that are actually dependent on the shape of the continents and the distribution of land on the planet. Today the currents are extremely, extremely complex and actually do depend on certain structure of certain continents. For example, we know that the warm oceanic current from the equator can easily carry all of this heat all the way to the north, even to regions like Greenland and Iceland. And a lot of this heat transfer is essentially why certain regions on the planet are a lot warmer than they should be. And so having a very specific structure to the continents and also having very specific regulation of the current on the planet is what actually allows planet Earth to maintain certain climatic conditions on the surface. If, however, let's say a new continent is formed or an old continent forms some sort of a structure that disrupts this current, it can actually lead to dramatic climatic changes as it most likely has in the past. But imagine now that all of these continents that we have today suddenly combine into one single continent. The dramatic transformation of the current activity on the surface would transform the climate of our planet to the point of either making the planet extremely hot or making it extremely cold. And so trying to simulate what the planet might look like in the next few hundreds of millions of years, and also trying to imagine where all of these different continents are going to be located in the future, is actually a pretty interesting hypothetical scenario that can help us understand what the climate of the planet might be in the next 200 to 300 million years, especially when the next supercontinent forms on the surface. And so not so long ago, several scientific teams presenting at the AGU, the American Geophysical Union, were actually discussing their recent simulations of what Earth might look like and how Earth might transform climatically as the new supercontinent forms. And all of this was actually based on the incredible NASA simulation that you can find in the description below, the simple version of which is right here, this is known as Roki or Roke 3D. The simple version here allows you to briefly simulate some of the more interesting versions of the planet, like for example, here's what Earth climatic conditions looked like in the pre-industrial era, and here's what all of this would look like if suddenly there was about four times more CO2 in the air. This simulation is actually extremely accurate at being able to simulate potential climatic conditions depending on the total solar illumination, the um, actual components on the surface, and of course also the idea behind how fast the planet spins, for example, or the continents on the surface. Here's, for example, what the surface of nearby Proxima b might look like, assuming that it has Earth-like atmosphere. And notice how here the heat is unequally distributed, and that's because the planet here is actually tidally locked to its star, with one side always facing the hot side, with the hottest temperature being about 3 degrees Celsius, and the colder side on the dark side of the planet being about minus 63 degrees Celsius. And so using Rogue 3 d the scientists um, presenting at AGU talked about several scenarios using several simulations and the potential implications of what Earth might look like in the future. 
And overall, it seems that there were two major possible scenarios that played out depending on where the continents flow and which direction they go. In the first scenario, it seems that the continents might once again form some sort of a central body, in this case the scientists refer to it as Orica, which might look slightly different depending on where the continents go. And in the second scenario, the continents might form something large on the north side of the planet near the North Pole, with Antarctica remaining as its own separate entity. In this case, the scientists refer to this continent as Amisha. All of this would happen anywhere from 200 to about 250 million years in the future and would also most likely last for at least a couple of hundred million years. And in order to calculate relatively accurate climatic conditions on this new Earth in the future, the scientists also had to consider the fact that Earth is going to spin a little bit slower, mostly because of the effects from the Moon, but the Sun at the same time will produce slightly more heat as well. And what's really unusual is that if the Earth ends up being a kind of a two-continent system with one being in the north and one being Antarctica in the south, this will actually leave really large regions of water in the equator completely empty of any continental influence. And because of this, the heat transport will become extremely difficult. In these particular simulations, the so-called Amisha ended up being an ice world. It's basically an idea of so-called uh, snowball Earth. The Earth became extremely cold extremely quick and eventually resulted in conditions where Earth eventually became a snowball Earth and uh, most of the life would probably have trouble surviving here. We know that this happened a few times in the past and we also know that um, in the last few million years, especially in the existence of complex life on the planet, nothing similar ever happened before. And so in some sense, we don't really know if the complex multicellular life is going to have trouble surviving during these times, especially if the Earth indeed becomes an extremely cold place. And with a single day being about 24 and a half hours instead of being just 24 hours, even that extra sunlight is not really going to help much because um, for the most part, once the ice starts forming on the surface, it's going to create a lot of reflection, a lot of albedo effect. And this albedo effect will actually result in Earth cooling down even more. And so in that sense, if for some reason Earth ends up having these two large continents, one in the north and one in the south, it might lead to a new, really, really cold period of the planet that will last for at least 100 million years. Although in their simulations they discovered that if there were less mountains in that particular continent known as Amasia, it would still allow for some surface to be not covered in snow and also allow for better heat transport, thus allowing the planet to be a little bit warmer. But nevertheless, the warmest region of Earth, the equator, would not really transfer as much heat, mostly because almost no continents will allow for this very effective current transport that we currently have on the planet because of all of the continents across the planet. However, in the other simulations, the supercontinent was right in the middle of the equator. And that of course suggests that the planet might be a lot warmer than today, and thus be an extremely different world with possibly even this huge tropical area and possibly even some deserts in the middle, all of which would be very different from what we have today, but also thus allowing the life to proliferate and to evolve much quicker, because we believe that in warmer climates and also with a lot more diversity of life in, for example, rainforest, the chance for evolution and the chance for proliferation is a lot higher. But which of these scenarios is going to play out and which of these continental configuration Earth is going to have is not a question we can answer right now. These are just predictions and possible suggestions to what Earth might become in the future, but for all we know, it might actually take a completely different route and become something else. However, we do think that at some point there is going to be another supercontinent, simply because they were cyclical so far and repeated every 300 to 400 million years. But I guess for now that's kind of all we can do and that's all we know about the future of Earth. I'm sure some other studies are going to come out in the next few months trying to clarify this or maybe even simulate this a little bit better. But for now we know that there's a chance Earth might become an ice world in the next 250 million years. And there's also a really high chance that Earth might become a very large tropical world. Which of these will occur we're not sure and only the future will tell. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing a potential resolution to a strange mystery that happened to our planet approximately 1 million years ago. The climate of our planet transitioned from having relatively short cycles to relatively long cycles, dramatically affecting the glaciation of our planet, making the actual ice ages last much longer. And this mystery, known as the Mid-Pleistocene Transition, or MTP for short, 
is one of the stranger events when it comes to the climatic changes on planet Earth. Something really dramatic happened on our planet, right around this time right here, creating very different cycles with extreme changes in temperature and thus affecting the evolution of life on our planet as well. So this is something that scientists have been trying to resolve for many decades now and it looks like this one paper right here might have finally found a resolution. And surprisingly this doesn't actually involve anything catastrophic or anything extreme. The explanation is very counterintuitive but extremely interesting. And so let's discuss this in a little bit more detail and also talk a little bit more about how the various cycles in regards to climate change transformed in the last two and a half million years. And let's actually start with a graph that shows us the geologic temperature of planet Earth, or basically the temperature, the average temperature in the last few millions of years. And here we're mostly interested in this up to basically this point. The era known as the Holocene, and especially some of the modern changes, is a completely different topic that has been discussed in some of the previous videos. Now first of all, take a look at the era known as Pliocene. This was between approximately 5 and 2.5 and million years ago. And during this era, the temperature was relatively stable, but it did decrease just a little bit right around this point right here. And this is the beginning of the era known as the Pleistocene where the climate suddenly transformed and the temperature was regularly going up and down in a very cyclical manner. And so I guess one question is what exactly happened here in order for the planet to suddenly start cooling down so much? Well, there are quite a lot of explanations, but two of them sort of stand out, with one of them specifically making the most sense. Right around this time, the two continents, North and South America, essentially became joined by what's known as the Isthmus of Panama. And this closure disrupted a major current around the planet that was sort of maintaining the warm temperatures on planet Earth, while at the same time creating some other currents such as the Gulf Stream that's sort of responsible for keeping certain regions in North Europe slightly warmer. And this major disruption slowly started to cool down the planet to the point where we now start having these cycles known as glaciation cycles. Or in other words, this was the beginning of the Ice Age. And for approximately one and a half million years, all of these cycles would usually last about 41,000 years. So basically you would have a glaciation followed by the thawing going into the other glaciation. But the actual glaciation periods were more or less mild and the temperature changes were not really that dramatic, with the glaciation cycles in this case being caused by the other cycle known as the Milankovitch cycle, at least that's the assumption today. There's a pretty good article from NASA that I'm posting in the description below that explains Milankovitch cycles in detail, but just to quickly summarize this, as the planet orbits around the Sun and as it sort of spins around as well, it experiences various changes in both its rotation and the orbit. For example, there is a slight change in eccentricity that happens roughly around every 100,000 years. There are also these wobbles, known as changes in obliquity, that happen every 41,000 years. And then we also have axial precessions, which usually are every 26,000 years. Now, altogether, all these cycles produce various variations in temperature that today are believed that were responsible for all of these glaciation periods in the beginning. Which is also why initially the cycle was 41,000 years. But then somewhere right here, approximately 1 million years ago, there was a sudden dramatic change in the way cycles progressed. First of all, they increased to 100,000 years, which technically would be equivalent to the eccentricity cycles. But at the same time, the temperature changes started to really go up and down way more dramatically. And as a result of this, our planet started to decrease in temperature even more, and the actual ice ages became way more extreme. And this graph right here demonstrates this pretty well. The initial glaciation cycles would only change the temperature by about maybe 5 degrees but some of the latest ones would change it by nearly 15 degrees between the hottest and the coldest periods, which naturally created a mystery that nobody knew the answer to, with the mystery itself today known as the mid-Pleistocene transition, or MPT. Now the actual change was not instant, it was not basically something catastrophic suddenly changing everything on the planet. It most likely happened sort of gradually, and it started approximately 1.2 million years ago, with the transition itself finishing around 0.7 million years ago, at which point all of the cycles were at their extremes. And on top of this, a lot of these cycles were very unpredictable, extremely asymmetric, and were just way too different from one another, which of course was really difficult to explain. And so the conclusion that many scientists came to is that 
Well, maybe something dramatic happened on a planet approximately 1.2 million years ago in order to cause this particular transition and this shift. But obviously, nobody really knew what exactly happened. And so, even though the initial assumption was that, well, maybe the Milankovitch cycles changed, or maybe something surrounding the solar system caused the cycles to be more extreme, none of this really made sense because it would be very, very difficult to explain and there was just not enough evidence. As a matter of fact, there is absolutely no evidence that these cycles ever changed in the last few millions of years. But there was actually evidence that the ocean currents changed. And this evidence sort of led the scientists behind the paper you can find in the description to finally sort of explain what might have happened during that period. And the overall conclusion is that, well, it's the ocean currents that changed over this period of time because of something happening in the northern Atlantic. And this of course makes sense, because as I mentioned before, for example, the Gulf Stream is actually responsible for carrying all of this warm water all the way to the northern hemisphere where it does warm up a lot of the region. And so if for some reason suddenly the current itself stops, or if it's affected in some other way, it can dramatically shift the climate of the planet. But what exactly caused the current to stop or to transform in some way? And so the scientists in this paper decided to see if there was any major change to some of the seafloor in the North Atlantic. And they did this by analyzing some of the ancient sediment present in the region. And what they discovered is that during that time, approximately 1.2 million years ago, the ice sheets started to stick to the floor a little bit more. And because of the sticking to the seafloor, they started to accumulate and build larger and larger ice formations, which eventually produced much larger glaciers, which increased in size every single cycle. Whereas prior to this, the seafloor was much more slippery, allowing some of the glaciers to move across and to not really build very large structures. And so as the glaciers grew in size and became bigger and bigger, they actually did two things. First of all, they completely disrupted the Atlantic current. Essentially, the heat could no longer reach some of the northern regions, which then led to even more glaciers. And at the same time, because there were more glaciers now, they also ended up reflecting more light, cooling down the planet even further. But because this was following the Milankovitch cycles, all of this would eventually start sort of reversing and the planet would start warming up again. But with every single cycle, because the seafloor became more and more rigid and attracted even more ice to stick to it, all of this would just end up producing larger glaciers with every single cycle until one of the last ones where the temperature changes were at their peak. And so in other words, by changing the seafloor over time, which was most likely caused by the previous glaciation cycles which slowly disrupted the smoothness of the seafloor, it eventually led to a buildup of a dramatically larger glaciers all across the northern region, which eventually culminated in the production of some of the largest ice sheets our planet has ever seen, while at the same time producing some of the lowest levels of water opening up certain regions where eventually our ancestors could traverse and sort of colonize various continents. During that last glaciation period, that's essentially when our ancestors were able to move from Africa to Europe to Asia to North and South America and to even Australia. And that's because during the glaciation period, the water levels dropped so much that it became extremely easy for a lot of our ancestors to just walk across from, for example, Asia to Australia. And so this mystery, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, had nothing to do with any major catastrophe. And in reality, it was all due to the crystalline bedrock that was essentially created by the continuous grinding of ice, turning the slippery continental soil into something much harder and something that was easier to stick to. Which by itself is actually a pretty important discovery. First of all, this highlights that the climate change is not always dependent on the atmosphere or even on the illumination from the sun itself. In this case, the climate change was caused entirely by changes in the ocean and specifically the changes on the seafloor, something that took approximately 500,000 years to transform. But it also sort of highlights how little we still understand about the changes on our planet and how this is actually a really important topic to try to study in detail and to try to understand because of these dramatic changes that can completely transform the planet. But also to some extent, it helps us understand our ancestry. It helps us learn more about what our ancestors most likely did 
and how they ended up traveling across the planet, and how they survived all of these ordeals. And so definitely a pretty interesting and a pretty important discovery, and something that we'll most likely talk about again in some of the future videos. But for now, there's actually one more thing I wanted to mention that I was going to mention in the beginning. The potential other source of the initial climate change approximately 2.5 million years ago. There are actually signs of at least one more source that might have dramatically cooled down the planet and continuously cooled down the planet for the past 3 million years. That source is a nearby supernova. And the signs of this are both in outer space, but also here on Earth. I've already talked about this in some of the previous videos, but essentially in the last few years scientists have been discovering signs of an iron isotope that's usually found in supernova. And all of these samples were coming from ice cores that were approximately two and a half million years old. Likewise, the astronomers have discovered this area around the solar system that's sometimes referred to as the local interstellar cloud. And this was definitely created by some sort of a supernova. And for the past two and a half million years, the solar system was actually traveling through this. And it's really only now that we might actually move out of it and possibly move into the other cloud. Now, on the one hand, all of this could potentially explain why the planet overall started to decrease in temperature. But at the same time, because we now left the cloud, it might explain why certain glaciation cycles kind of stopped. Now, a lot of this is still a bit of a speculation, and there is still just not enough evidence to say any of this for certain, but it is one of the potential explanations to some of the climatic changes in the last few millions of years. And specifically the glaciation cycles, and also some of the changes in, for example, forests. So a typical supernova, if it happened relatively close to us, it does have a potential to remove a very large part of the ozone layer, which protects us from dangerous radiation. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about hurricanes once again. But not just any hurricanes. We're going to be talking about space hurricanes. The first ever detection of an actual space hurricane from right here on planet Earth. And this is something we've actually never seen before. So let's discuss this in a little bit more detail because there are a lot of really cool things you might learn today. First of all, obviously space hurricanes can actually mean a lot of things. A lot of the hurricanes we detect on Jupiter and on Saturn, for example, are of course space hurricanes as well. There are really large storms formed on other planets in space. And we've seen a lot of these hurricane-like formations on all of the major gas giants, including of course Neptune and Uranus. They all have different sort of creation stories. They also have somewhat different way that they act on the planet and how long they actually stay on the planet. But for the most part, that's actually not at all what we're talking about today. We've also seen certain type of hurricane-like activity on Mars. Hubble telescope was actually able to take this snapshot right here approximately two decades ago, showing us that hurricane-like activity also happens in very thin Martian atmosphere. And the hurricane itself was located right here in the northern hemisphere, specifically near the northern pole of Mars, that was apparently four times larger than the state of Texas. And just like Earth, they were formed in a relatively similar way, they were formed through the interaction of heat with cold weather. And although here on Earth, the hurricanes are formed and powered by the warmth coming from the water itself, surprisingly, on Mars, the heat came from the darker patches you can actually see in this region right here, which actually acted as the source of energy for this pretty large cyclone to be able to form and to then navigate this region with the energy itself or the heat itself being produced by the sun. Because those patches are darker, they would absorb more heat and thus be able to emit more heat long term. And then of course similar phenomena have also been spotted on the surface of the sun. And so in that sense, space hurricane is not actually clearly defined. It can hypothetically mean any of these things. But the new study that you can find in the description below describes a space hurricane as something happening here on Earth, but actually in space, right above our planet literally a space hurricane. And this is exactly what the scientists in the paper were able to discover. And although the existence of these space hurricanes has actually been implied in several other papers, this is the first time ever it was actually physically confirmed and we now know they exist for sure. But it's not a hurricane formed from, for example, moisture or formed from some sort of a gas. It was literally a plasma hurricane with the rain itself or precipitation being made out of electrons. So in other words, it was circulating in plasma, creating electron rain. Which kind of reminds me of the chocolate rain, that famous song by Tay Zonday, who's also apparently a regular viewer of the channel. Hey Tay! 
Anyway, so it turns out electron rain is a thing. But the question is how does this all work and why exactly did we not know about any of this until now? Well, the how part is somewhat easy to answer. Nobody actually noticed it until now. It was originally discovered back in 2014 in some of the satellite footage from Defense Meteorological Satellite Program that consists of four satellites constantly collecting data. And the data was there, but nobody actually connected the dots. And since it didn't involve any air and involved a lot of plasma air, it was actually somewhat difficult to recreate all of this data. But the scientists in this paper were able to do this and even created these images as well as a 3D model showing us what's probably going on here. And if we were to try to simulate it, it would sort of look like this. It was kind of like a typical aurora, except that it was actually acting like a hurricane. It would change its shape, it would cycle around, and it would obviously also have a somewhat quiet center in the middle, yet extremely active cyclone-like formations moving on the side. And although previously I mentioned that this is somewhat different from a typical hurricane, there are still quite a lot of similarities, mostly because it's still technically gas. In this case, it's plasma or ionized gas. So it's gas that's controlled by the magnetic fields, not so much by the effects of warm water. It also seemed to contain multiple spiral arms like a typical hurricane. And just like a hurricane, as I mentioned before, it also had precipitation. But it wasn't rain, it wasn't water, it was electrons something that you see illustrated in this image right here. But how this was generated is of course another question. So it seems that this was created because of two things. First of all, it seemed to have only been possible because it was during the low solar activity. In other words, the sun was not producing a lot of plasma headed our way, and so the plasma around the planet, around planet Earth, was allowed to circulate and was allowed to expand more. Here's actually a really awesome simulation from NASA that's going to show you what happened back in 2012 when a relatively large and relatively powerful flare or technically coronal mass ejection hit planet Earth. It sort of decreases the amount of plasma right next to the planet and also obviously changes a lot of the magnetic lines as well. So this event as you can see was pretty powerful. And then regularly it kind of looks more like this. And in 2014 when the solar activity was much lower, it allowed more plasma to form around the planet which also created a somewhat interesting motion of the magnetic lines toward the north of our planet, while at the same time allowing the magnetic lines to reconnect and thus create a kind of a current continuity that lasted for several hours and basically allowed the northern hemisphere of our planet to experience this hurricane-like effect. Or another way of thinking about this is, as these magnetic lines started to reconnect, they created enough energy to allow the ionosphere to flow in one single direction in a circle around the central region, which then in effect created everything else including the precipitation of electrons and potentially a lot of other effects which might be explored in some of the future studies. But more importantly, we now think that this is probably a universal effect. It might actually exist on other planets and potentially can exist in much, much larger capacity on planets like Jupiter and Saturn that do have a much stronger magnetosphere. It seems that the magnetic lines kind of create this effect and so the stronger the magnetic lines, the more hurricane-like activity you should be detecting in space as well. And since Juno mission is still active around Jupiter, it might be able to provide certain answers once the scientists know what to look for and what kind of data to analyze. Since this is a completely new discovery, nobody really knows if these exist around other planets. But what this discovery also implies is that assuming we know what to look for, and also assuming that these space hurricanes do exist around other planets, we might be able to use this to detect magnetospheres of other planets. And since this study suggests that these hurricanes only happen when the solar activity is at the minimum, this might also lead to a lot of new studies in regards to the solar activity or to the activity of other stars as well. By detecting these space hurricanes around other planets, we might be able to find out how active certain star systems are. So in other words, this actually presents an important opportunity for studying exoplanets, but also for studying planets in our own solar system. And at the same time, we still don't really know if it affects life here on planet Earth, but since it does produce a very interesting electron rain, we might actually want to look into this. We don't really know if it's dangerous, and if it is dangerous, maybe this is something we need to be aware of. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing water or actually the origin of water here on planet Earth. And specifically we're talking about a new study that seems to have uncovered another potential source from which water might have come. A somewhat unlikely source as a matter of fact. 
that source being our sun itself. So the study that, as always, you can find in the description below, presents a pretty strong argument that at least some of the water might have actually come from the sun. And that, of course, needs a bit of an explanation because, as you probably know, sun is mostly made out of hydrogen. But to start, let's discuss the idea of the origin of water still being a bit of a mystery. Now, for many years, for many decades, the scientists thought that maybe it came from various asteroids and various comets. As a matter of fact, comets were the primary assumed source simply because of the amount of water present on their surface and inside of them. But then we got to visit some of these comets, including the famous 67P comet, and during the Rosetta mission, the scientists have discovered that the water present here was a little bit different. It wasn't the same water as what we have on planet Earth. And to be more exact, it was the difference in the isotope composition of water itself. So here on Earth, water generally has three very specific isotopes in a very specific ratio that's only present here on planet Earth. And that's in terms of mass. In reality, you actually have six different isotopes based on how heavy the oxygen and how heavy the hydrogen are as well. But investigating comets, the scientists discovered a completely different ratio there. Which of course suggested to the scientists that it's most likely that some of the water came from somewhere else, or possibly even most of the water on Earth was not from comets. Now the next obvious explanation would be asteroids and cosmic dust, but to date only in some of the asteroids the isotopes sort of matched, but unfortunately there are just not enough of them around to explain the amount of water on planet Earth. And the asteroids we usually refer to as the carbonaceous chondrites seem to match the best but these represent only roughly around 5% of all of the asteroids that fall on our planet, so the numbers here just don't add up. Something other than asteroids should also be producing some of the other water, possibly even most of it. Now, one of the bigger explanations from a few years ago did not look for the solution in outer space. It actually looked for the solution inside the planet. And this explanation or this proposition that you can watch in one of the older videos suggested that a lot of the water probably came from within the planet, from the minerals that already had water when the planet was just created. For example, one of these minerals that's well known to actually have a lot of water on the inside is the mineral located approximately a thousand kilometers underneath the surface of planet Earth and it's known as ring woodite. But unfortunately, these propositions are somewhat difficult to prove, mostly because we can't just go inside the planet and measure how much water is potentially stored there. And so even though the explanation was quite unique and also explained the potential origin of water, it was almost impossible to scientifically prove this, unless of course we find a way to study ringwoodite in its natural setting and see how much water it stores on, for example, some other planet or in some other environment. So far this hasn't really been possible and most of the ringwoodite is usually studied in a very limited lab situation. And so without knowing the exact composition of isotopes inside the planet itself, it would be basically impossible for us to prove this idea. Okay, well now we seem to have another proposition, and this proposition takes us back to outer space. With the main origin of all of this being the solar wind itself, the extremely charged particles that come from the sun and essentially represent tiny hydrogen molecules, with the origin of this water being the solar wind. The wind itself, of course, composed of various charged hydrogen particles. But this is not a new proposition at all. This paper from 2012 was already able to show that certain types of hydrogen ions can actually react with various rocks, various silicate minerals, which would then result in the production of tiny amounts of water on the surface and even inside of the silicates. But in this case, the recent paper proposes that a lot of the solar wind in this case could actually interact with tiny dust particles and also tiny asteroids and possibly even big asteroids, producing various amounts of water on their surface. But more specifically, it proposes that a lot of water can be formed in a lot of other types of asteroids that haven't really been studied to date very thoroughly just yet. In other words, they suggest that it's not just carbonaceous chondrites that could deliver water, it's also cosmic dust and potentially some other types of asteroids that have generally been believed to be water-free, but in reality they might have contained water somewhere on their surface or somewhere else inside of them that has actually not been detected. And in this particular case, they focused on the studies of samples taken from this beautiful asteroid known as Itokawa, the samples that were returned to Earth back in 2011 by JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency. And this was of course the first asteroid retrieval mission that was also known as Hayabusa, but this was Hayabusa 1, 
Very recently, Japan also succeeded with the Hayabusa 2 mission. But this here is what's known as an S-type asteroid. Asteroids that are known to be relatively high in density and contain mostly just simple rocks. And so the scientists in the study wanted to see if this asteroid could also be a potential source of certain types of water, but specifically they wanted to investigate the samples for the presence of water right on the surface of these samples that would be similar to the composition of the solar wind itself. Specifically, they were really looking for the uh, isotopes of hydrogen. Here they used a very, very rigorous technique known as atom probe tomography. It's essentially a technique developed back in 1967 where an extremely precise measurements of each individual atoms can actually provide extremely accurate composition of a certain sample and even create a three-dimensional image of what happens inside the sample as well. And so by applying this technique to the samples from the asteroid, they've discovered that the surface of the samples contain various water and hydroxide molecules, with most of the enrichment being on the surface itself, suggesting that it was most likely created by a lot of hydrogen coming from the sun itself, which by bombarding the asteroid over billions of years, very likely inserted a lot of these molecules relatively deep inside the surface, which then turned into water that stayed there for a long time. But more importantly, all of this was discovered at just the right depth, where the scientists theoretically predicted all of this to exist. And because in this case this water was much lighter in terms of its mass, it, it was a lighter isotope, this very likely added to the total content of water on planet Earth, along with some of the other sources. In other words, the water in these asteroids was very likely just an additional source, it wasn't really the entire source. But because it would also be present in a lot of different particles, such as cosmic dust and a lot of smaller particles hitting our planet pretty much every second, Given billions of years, this would add up to a relatively large content of water accumulating on the surface of Earth. And the study also suggests that in a typical S-type asteroid, it would actually contain approximately 20 liters of water for every cubic meter of rock, which, based on the total mass of the asteroids in the solar system, may explain where some of the or a lot of the water on Earth possibly came from. But this also explains something else about the water in other locations, for example, the moon. One of the bigger mysteries in the last few decades was the discovery of a lot of water deposits on the surface of the moon in various locations where it was believed to not exist. And so this would be an explanation for how a lot of this water could also be produced on the moon, which means that future explorations of the moon could maybe use this to extract some of the water. On top of this, because some of this water is produced underneath the top layer, it's actually protected from a lot of other elements, and so it can remain inside these rocks for a pretty long time, which makes some of these asteroids a potential source of future water for, for example, when we start traveling across the solar system, or possibly even between stars. For example, some of the space missions in the future could maybe harvest the cosmic dust and smaller asteroids, and then extract water from within them. Which of course means that in some of the future missions, maybe the astronauts wouldn't even have to bring that much water with them, they can just harvest it directly from space itself. And this would also be the case for the surface of the moon. If we can find a way to extract the water from here, we'll be able to create a functioning colony. But this also means that maybe some of the other stars that produce even more solar wind could maybe produce more water. Now that's something that we're not going to know until future studies and until very thorough investigations of other planets and other star systems, but it's a really interesting proposition. For example, in the TRAPPIST-1 system, all of the planets and of course all of the asteroids here are bombarded with way way more solar wind coming from the parent star. And this could mean maybe more water. Or at least based on the study and based on our understanding of how hydrogen ions can potentially form water molecules. But only future studies will tell what's happening here and if there's actually any liquid water on the surface of those planets. And also ironically, some of the previous studies about TRAPPIST-1 that discovered that it has something like 100 times more solar wind than our own solar system, suggested that the strength of the solar wind could potentially strip everything from the surface of these planets, including of course water and including of course atmosphere. And so at the end of the day, it might actually come down to having some sort of a balance. The solar wind has to be strong enough, but not too strong. But that's of course just a speculation for now. No studies have been conducted just yet. But anyway, it's definitely a really interesting discovery, and definitely a different way for us to see our sun. It looks like it's also a provider of water, not just energy.
Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some other major discoveries in regards to our own planet, planet Earth. And we're going to go back inside our planet this time, and discuss some of the major discoveries coming from the inner core of our planet, the solid core to be more specific. The part that you see represented by this really large sun-like or star-like bowl right in the middle of the planet. And this part of our planet is particularly interesting because a lot of new things have been discovered over the past few months in regards to the inner solid core. One of them I've already discussed in one of the previous videos and it suggests that there's actually another core inside this particular core that wasn't really known before. But the new study that you can find in the description below goes even further. They discover some other unusual parameters that have previously been sort of mentioned in other studies as well. But first, what do we know about this core as of today? Well, if we remove the crust, the mantle, and the outer core, which is uh, the liquid metal represented by this yellow formation right here, we find the central region known as the inner core. And this particular region has been growing by about one millimeter every single year. Which of course implies that the core itself is growing over time, but it also implies that at some point in the history of the planet there was no solid core. The core inside the planet was just iron nickel liquid core, and it very likely stayed this way for billions and billions of years. And the recent study estimates that the solid core only started forming approximately 500 million years ago, which is of course already after the life evolved on the planet and even after more complex life started developing as well. Which is extremely interesting and somewhat unusual because today a lot of the theories involving the magnetic field of our planet suggest that the magnetic field of the planet depends on the activity of the outer liquid core, not so much of the inner core. But the magnetic field itself and the protection that it provides to the planet still directly depends on the interaction between the solid core and the liquid core. And so it's still not entirely clear how the planet was able to maintain and even have much stronger magnetosphere billions of years ago. This is a mystery that nobody really has an answer to just yet. But what's clear is that the inner core is definitely growing and for the most part it seems to be made out of what's known as the crystallized iron nickel layer. And the cooling and the changes of the inner core provide all of the energy for the outer core to drive the dynamo, while also assisting and providing energy for the maintenance of the magnetic field of planet Earth. But the way that the core grows is somewhat unusual and to some extent not really well understood. For example, a few years ago the scientists realized and also published a study that you can find in the description below that suggested that the outer core was contributing to the inner core formation through a very similar phenomenon to what we would call snowing. But unlike the snow on the surface of the planet, the snow inside the planet was a result of some sort of a very complex crystallization of iron nickel alloys. So essentially the iron and nickel inside the planet as it cools down and as it becomes crystallized sort of snows down onto the surface of the solid core and eventually starts to accumulate these large snowflakes of iron nickel that slowly grow the surface of the inner core and thus increase the size over time. Now naturally it's not very easy to imagine all of this and also not particularly intuitive to even think about this, but the studies do provide a lot of evidence that this unusual iron nickel snow is the reason why the core is slowly growing in size with the outer core being very likely composed of some sort of a liquidy, somewhat unusual and highly pressurized iron nickel material and as this solidifies and starts forming tiny crystals or possibly even large crystals, it falls onto the surface of the solid core and grows this really large iron nickel snowball on the inside. And although I still find it very difficult to imagine what exactly happens inside the planet, it very likely is somewhat similar to the liquid cycle on the surface, except that everything here is just this really really hot molten metal. But it doesn't grow it on all sides equally, which is another surprise. Apparently, and this was discovered quite a while ago, one side seems to be growing faster than the other side. And this was even further confirmed in a recent study that discovered that the core was indeed lopsided. It was slightly heavier on the western hemisphere compared to the eastern hemisphere. While at the same time, when looking at various seismic waves traveling through the planet, the scientists also realized that if you were to send a wave north to south as opposed to west to east, you would actually travel faster. This to scientists also suggested that the crystals inside the core have a preference for how they align themselves 
creating a very complex alignment of crystals, these hexagonal crystals that you see right here, with the longer axis of these crystals being aligned south to north. Which is why the seismic waves tend to travel faster south to north as opposed to east to west. But even though it's aligned more or less equally south to north, it definitely has a lot more inequality when it comes to west to east. With the western side being larger than the eastern side. And this of course implies that the crystallization process seems to happen more frequently or in some sense the planet seems to be losing more heat on the west side as opposed to the east side. The crystallization process in this case directly depends on the energy exchange and because the western side seems to be growing faster it means that the heat is escaping from that region faster as well. And this asymmetric growth is about 60% more efficient on one of the sides. Or basically the western side is growing 60% faster than the eastern side. With the actual axis offset being about 400 kilometers or about 250 miles. And this of course implies that the core itself is not really spherical and more of an egg shape. It's not entirely clear why it's growing faster on one side, but in terms of the region where it's growing faster, it seems to be happening a little bit faster right here under Indonesia. And it seems to be happening slower under Brazil. So this is the region where the iron core than everywhere else on the planet. But it clearly is not certain if this affects the planet in any way. As a matter of fact, because all of this is happening so slowly, and because this is something that's been happening for the past 500 million years, we don't even know what effects this might have on the planet or any planet out there. Either way, this does imply that the crystallization is happening a little bit faster on one of the sides. Or another way of looking at this is, well, the iron snow. It seems to be snowing a little bit more directly under Indonesia compared to directly under Brazil. But unfortunately for now, this kind of creates more mysteries than provides answers. For example, it still does not explain how the magnetic field was able to function billions of years ago and how it evolved over time in the last 500 million years when the solid core started to be developed. However, it does help us understand the properties of the inner core a little bit better. So for example, technically speaking, it is actually sort of liquid with the outer core being a little bit more liquid as well, but an extremely viscous liquid, way, way more viscous than anything we're used to. So for example, when it comes to viscosity, honey that you see right here is already pretty viscous. It doesn't flow very well. But when it comes to things like glass, for example, it is a crystal, but it also flows. So in some sense, you can also call it a liquid. And that's kind of similar to what we believe inner core to be as well. In terms of viscosity though, glass has a viscosity of about 1 million times higher than the inner core. So inner core flows a little bit faster. But if you were to compare this to honey, the viscosity of honey is like trillions of times less. And that means that honey flows much easier. So it kind of helps you imagine that the inner core is sort of liquid, but definitely not a type of a liquid we're used to here on planet Earth. Anyway, so basically it's viscous, but not as viscous as glass. Which of course might also imply that over millions of years of spinning and evolving, it might also sort of change its shape. So it's quite possible that over time it will actually transform into something a little bit different and might even stretch into some other direction. But obviously nobody knows what's going to happen in the next few millions and billions of years. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about the albedo of planet Earth. More specifically, the recent study that discovered the albedo of our planet has actually dropped in the last few decades. But what exactly is albedo, and what does this all mean for our planet? So let's discuss these concepts in more detail, starting with albedo. In the nutshell, albedo just means reflectivity, how much light is reflected from a certain object. The word itself stems from Latin and it means whiteness. And scientifically speaking, it essentially measures the amount of solar radiation reflected from an object and it's measured on a scale from 0 to 1. With 0 being something extremely dark and something that doesn't reflect anything, and we've actually discovered at least one planet out there that seems to have albedo of about 0.02, the darkest planet ever discovered. The planet known as Tress 2b and it potentially looks something like this. And we also have some really reflective objects here in the solar system, with for example Enceladus, the moon of Saturn, being one of the most reflective bodies known to us. Here the reflectivity is about 0.9. 
But albedo itself is a really complex concept and it's also not constant. For example, for planet Earth, it changes quite a lot depending on the atmospheric conditions and also depending on the weather effects and a lot of other conditions that are usually very difficult to predict. For example, here are the calculations for the albedo during the completely clear skies, whereas here is what it looks like when you have a lot of clouds and a lot of different weather phenomena that could potentially increase the albedo quite a lot. So, for example, things like some of the clouds in the upper atmosphere and things like snow will have very, very high albedo, whereas things like ocean water or things like asphalt will have an extremely low albedo and will actually absorb a lot of light. Nevertheless, on average, the albedo of planet Earth is anywhere from 0.3 to sometimes 0.35, and it usually varies because of the cloud cover and because of various atmospheric conditions. But something really interesting came out of this paper that was only published a few weeks ago. Here the scientists used an extremely interesting technique to study albedo of our planet and discovered something intriguing and something a little bit disturbing. They discovered that on average in the last couple of decades, the average albedo of our planet has dropped by about 0.5%, equivalent to approximately half a watt of radiation per square meter which suggests that in the last couple of decades, our planet started to absorb more energy than reflect into outer space. But before I talk about the potential implications and what all of this means, let's talk about the more interesting part first. How exactly did they measure all of this? I mean, how do you measure the total reflectivity of the entire planet and combine the effects of the reflectivity for the past few decades? Well, there's a really, really interesting technique and it's called planet shine, also known as earth shine. And here's how this works. You might have seen this picture before. This is the picture taken by the Cassini mission, and it's a picture of Saturn's rings. They're shining. They're producing what's known as the ring shine. And this ring shine then reflects onto the atmosphere of Saturn and is actually visible in the picture itself. Here's another interesting example of a different type of light planet shine. This right here is Saturn shine. This tiny patch of light you see right here, that's produced by the reflection of light from Saturn itself with this here being produced by the sun. And so this idea of planet shine or ring shine or blank shine has been known to us for a very, very long time. It's basically when an object reflects the light from the sun and that light then strikes another object, creating some sort of a bright patch on the surface. And well, naturally something similar happens with planet Earth and our moon. This sketch right here was created by Leonardo da Vinci back in the 16th century. And even back then, the early astronomers realized that our moon was shining on two sides. Today, this is referred to as the Earth shine, and it's something that's usually visible when you see moon forming the crescent, and then you also see the dark part of the moon being slightly brighter than it should be. We can even try to simulate the effects of Earth shine by using Space Engine. And so here, if we look at the moon, this is obviously the far side, with the near side being almost entirely dark to us. If I start increasing the albedo effects from planet Earth, you'll notice how the moon sort of starts getting brighter. Let's try this again. So here the albedo is very low, here the albedo is very high. And so notice how the Earth shine changes the luminosity coming from the dark side of the moon. And so hypothetically, we can actually measure the amount of light coming from the dark side of the moon and thus measure the so-called Earth shine or the reflectivity from planet Earth. Which is pretty much exactly how, for the past few decades, the scientists have been measuring the total albedo of planet Earth. They've essentially measured it by measuring the amount of light reflected from the dark side of the moon. And to make sure that these results were not some sort of a fluke, the scientists in this paper used the data from two completely different methods of observation. So the data that you see in black here is from what's known as the Big Bear Solar Observatory, also known as BBSO. This particular observatory has been running a project known as Project Earthshine for the past few decades. You can learn more about this from one of the links in the description below. And then they combined this with the results from the mission, from the NASA mission, known as CERES. CERES stands for Clouds and Earth's Radiant Energy System, and it's essentially an instrument attached to several satellites that tries to measure the total reflectivity of clouds combining it into an annual distribution of reflectivity across the entire planet. And so the data from blue here, that's the data from Ceres from the satellites measuring the reflection from the clouds. And while both the Earthshine and the cloud reflectivity 
seems to suggest that the total reflectivity or total albedo of planet Earth has decreased by about half a percent in the last two decades, with the total reflectivity from the clouds being affected a lot more. And although naturally one of the assumptions here could be maybe the sun has decreased in luminosity because of some sort of a cycle, the study did not find any correlation between the changes in the terrestrial albedo and the solar activity. So it definitely does not seem to be the sun itself. Something on earth is changing, causing the total albedo to decrease over time. And so all of this to some extent suggests that maybe it's because of some sort of a climatic changes on the planet. Now this is really intriguing because in some of the previous studies, some scientists have suggested that because of the climate change, we might actually experience more clouds because as the water evaporates from the oceans, it will produce more clouds which will then increase the albedo of the planet. But this study seems to suggest the opposite. Even though the warming of the planet and the albedo effects are more or less correlated, the warming of the oceans did not increase the albedo. The reflectivity of the planet instead decreased by just a tiny amount, more or less correlated with the average temperatures of the oceans. Although in this case, it would be really difficult to find the actual cause of the decrease of albedo. For example, one potential explanation here could be because of some sort of a pollutant that's present in the atmosphere. Generally speaking, certain elements in the atmosphere, specifically certain chemicals, can hypothetically either increase or decrease reflections from the planet. And so for all we know, maybe some of these changes are actually because of the pollution. But the measurements from various NASA satellites, such as the Aqua satellite you see right here, the satellite that does have one of these series instruments on board that measure the reflections from the cloud, nevertheless also suggests that the reflectivity from the clouds decreased by just a little bit. And so the combination of the increase in greenhouse gases and the overall decrease in albedo unfortunately have a somewhat bad effect on our planet. They start increasing the temperature on the planet by a lot more than it would increase otherwise. But despite these observations, it's still very early to tell exactly what's happening here. For all we know, the actual cause could be entirely different from what we currently think. And because of this, the scientists in this paper encourage more analysis and more observations trying to figure out if the albedo is truly decreasing and if so, what exactly is causing it. And so hopefully the observations in the next few years will help us establish what's really happening here and what exactly is happening to our planet or more importantly what's going to happen to our planet in the next few decades. Although I guess the most disappointing discovery from this particular study is really the effect in regards to clouds. Even though some scientists were kind of hoping that the increase in temperature will produce more clouds and thus increase albedo, the results from this study definitively tell us that the albedo seems to be decreasing as the temperature increases as well. And that just makes things a little bit worse for us, or at least a little bit more difficult to deal with when it comes to the climate change on planet Earth. Now we'll talk more about this in some of the future videos and once new studies come out, but I guess until then, well, this is something else to kind of be aware of. Our planet seems to be reflecting a little bit less light and thus absorbing a little bit more light, approximately half a percent more than it used to a couple of decades ago. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to try to resolve the mystery of the oxygenation of planet Earth. Why does our planet have so much oxygen? And did something specific happen to planet Earth that resulted in the sudden increase in oxygen on the planet? With one recent paper suggesting that the answer could be yes. Something might have happened to planet Earth millions and millions of years ago, providing the necessary conditions for the sudden oxygenation of the entire planet, for the evolution of complex life, and for the evolution of intelligence on the planet as well. All of this was a result of oxygen. But what caused this oxygenation event? So that's the question we're going to try to answer today. Something that was recently discussed in this paper you can find in the description below. And let's start with the answer itself. Or I guess let me give you the spoiler. The scientists in this paper believe that it's actually the rotation of the planet or the speed of the rotation that caused the planet to suddenly have a lot of oxygen. But they give a really really unique and extremely interesting reason for why they think so and explain this using a very very interesting example from planet Earth. But before we start with the explanation, well, you have to remember that Earth constantly changes its rotation speed even though we don't generally notice it. For example, the tragic Indian Ocean earthquake event from 2004 changed the rotation of the planet by roughly around 3 milliseconds. 
It doesn't sound like a huge change, and it's not, but it's still there. Even certain human constructions change the rotation of the planet because of the distribution of mass that they cause. The Chinese Three Gorges Dam, for example, changed the water level so much that the calculations show it changed the rotation of the planet by 0.06 milliseconds. But these examples of rotation change are kind of trivial. Most of the rotational influence on the planet come from our own moon. The moon is responsible for the majority of changes when it comes to rotation speed on planet Earth. And so here, even though modern day is roughly around 24 hours in length, if our moon did not exist, if it wasn't actually orbiting planet Earth, even after 4.5 billion years of orbiting the Sun, the day on Earth would be roughly around 6 hours long. And that's because the tidal interactions between the Earth and the Moon are directly affecting their sort of orbital dents around one another and also their rotational speed. And this is why the Moon is always facing Earth with the same side, because of these tidal interactions and because of the way that they actually influence one another. And the way the story goes is as follows. So about 4.5 billion years ago, a slightly smaller planet known as Theia very likely collided with early Earth. And today we refer to this as the Giant Impact Hypothesis. And following the initial impact, the debris that's formed around the planet eventually formed the early Moon. And so approximately 30,000 years after the collision, a single day on Earth was about 6 hours long. But within about 16 million years, because of the Earth-Moon interaction, this actually decreased to about 10 hours. And in case you're wondering why, well, the short explanation goes as follows. As the Moon orbits the planet, it creates the lunar tides that you see right here. It's like these two protrusions on both sides of the planet. But because our planet is also spinning, and it actually spins faster than the orbit of the Moon, the tidal bulges end up getting shifted just a little bit in front of the Moon. And so the Moon ends up pulling at these tidal bulges, which ends up slowing down the rotation of planet Earth. And it's going to keep doing this until the rotation of planet Earth matches the orbit of the Moon. Or basically until planet Earth is facing the Moon with the same side as well. This right here is referred to as the tidal breaking. And this tidal interaction between the Moon and Earth ends up doing two things. First, it obviously slows down the rotation of both objects, but it also ends up transferring some of the orbital energy away from the Moon, which ends up moving the Moon farther and farther away. And so even though initially the Moon was really, really close to planet Earth, possibly about a few tens of thousand kilometers away from the center, eventually it moved to the region where it is today, almost 400,000 kilometers away. But in the beginning, when the Moon was really close to planet Earth, that's when it had a lot of effect on the rotation of the planet. It was much easier back then for the Moon to slow down our planet. But as it moved farther and farther away, the effects dropped dramatically as well. And so it took about a billion years for the planet to have a day of about 12 hours. Which also coincides with the first signs of life on the planet. But for about a billion years, the life stayed more or less primitive. This is actually before the photosynthesis, before the multicellular life, and before anything complex started to appear. But by the time the first photosynthetic life started to appear on the planet, and the first oxygen started to be produced, a single day on Earth was roughly around 18 hours in length. This was approximately 2.5 billion years ago. And when the first multicellular life appeared, the day was already 23 hours long. And so the scientists in this recent study actually believe there is a very specific reason for this, and this is not just an interesting correlation. They do believe that the rotation of the planet served to sort of help life evolve and to produce more oxygen. And so here's how they reason about this and how they found some of the evidence. We know that pretty much most of the oxygen on the planet today is formed by photosynthetic life. Which is actually one of the reasons why a lot of scientists today believe that by finding oxygen somewhere else out there, on another planet, we might be able to find some kind of an extraterrestrial life as well. But what is unusual is that it took such a long time for the oxygen to actually become prominent on the planet, and it took several major oxygenation events for the life to become suddenly diverse and for the oxygen to become everywhere. As a matter of fact, between the first signs of oxygen approximately 2.5 billion years ago, and the appearance of a lot of complex life, there is a period of about 2 billion years that is kind of difficult to explain. In other words, why exactly did it take so long for the oxygen to become established on the planet? What factors could have played a role in establishing the oxygenation events and in making complex life possible on the planet? And in this particular paper, the scientists believe that there was really probably one main factor, the rotation speed of planet Earth. And so let's discuss the evidence, and it's actually from a place in North America, 
Lake Huron, as a matter of fact, very, very close to the border of Canada. And in this case, I wanted to use Google Earth to show you exactly where they studied a lot of these formations that were discussed in this paper. So it's very close to the lake shore, near a place called Alpina that you see right here. And there are several islands here that seem to contain very unusual sinkholes that are quite easily visible in this map from Google Earth. These blue formations, these are sinkholes. There's one right here, there's another one right here, and there's actually quite a lot of them all over the place. And completely by accident, a lot of these sinkholes form these very unique and somewhat isolated biospheres that contain life that seems almost archaic, it seems almost ancient. There's practically nothing else that's surviving there because there is so little oxygen, but the bottom of these sinkholes contain something that looks like another world. It's these unusual mats of cyanobacteria, with some of these mats being purple in color because they contain a very specific type of a purple oxygen producing cyanobacteria that's existed on the planet for approximately two and a half billion years. Now in this particular paper they focused on the sinkhole around this island right here that's known as the middle island. And specifically it's this one here. And these sinkholes create extreme conditions. There's practically no oxygen on the bottom other than the oxygen produced by these unusual cyanobacteria. And because there's practically no other life present here, for example, no plants, no fish, almost nothing can exist here. Okay, some fish can exist, but not for a very long time. Because of this, this represents a kind of a picture of what ancient Earth might have actually looked like. Or actually what ancient Earth looked like for billions of years during the existence of these early cyanobacteria and early bacteria that were responsible for some of the early gases on the planet. Now it just so happens though that this is not the only organism living here and as a matter of fact these purple cyanobacteria are sort of competing for space with the other bacteria and specifically the white sulfur oxidizing bacteria that instead of oxygen actually use sulfur. And so while the cyanobacteria need oxygen to generate energy, the sulfur-loving bacteria need sulfur. But they both live in the same space and they both compete for the space. So for example, once in a while, a gas from inside the planet, like methane or hydrogen sulfide, will create these unusual bubbles that you see right here. And these finger-like formations are used by the sulfur-loving bacteria to essentially live and to produce energy. Generally, during nighttime, or essentially from dusk until dawn, the entire upper layer is dominated by the sulfur-loving bacteria, with the cyanobacteria being underneath, so essentially, if you were to shine the light here, it would all look more or less white. Mostly because the sulfur-loving bacteria are white in color. But then the sun comes out, and the cyanobacteria start to come up to the top, pushing the sulfur bacteria underneath them, and they stay this way for the entire day. And turns out they do this kind of a dance every single day. When the sun is out, the purple is on top, when the sun is down, the purple is in the bottom. I guess kind of makes sense. But what the scientists recently realized is that, well, it seems that there is a slight delay. Every single day it takes at least a few hours for the cyanobacteria to sort of dominate the top, to actually come up to the top, to start producing all of the oxygen and to start producing all of the energy they need. In other words, it's not an instant event. There is a slight delay in their response and because of this they are only limited to a few hours per day to be able to produce the oxygen and of course to produce all of the energy. And this gave the scientists a kind of a hint. Well, what if the Earth day was much shorter? Would they actually have any chance to produce any oxygen whatsoever? And so to try to investigate what kind of results they would get, they crunched the numbers using global models for oxygen levels. With this figure right here sort of showing their discovery. With a day that's only about 12 hours long, practically no oxygen is created at all. When a day was about 16 hours long, you get a little bit of oxygen. And it's really only when the day is about 21 to 24 hours long where you suddenly start getting quite a lot of oxygen released by the cyanobacteria that does tend to take its sweet time to start producing oxygen. With a day that's about 52 hours long producing pretty much double the amount of oxygen we have today. And if we compare what we have in this graph to what we know about the planet Earth historically, so this right here corresponds to the creation of early life on the planet three and a half billion years ago. Whereas this right here corresponds to some of the early life that produced oxygen, and this right here is closer to the Great Oxygenation Event. More importantly, because we know that there was also an oxygenation event 
approximately 800 million years ago, this study and the results from this study would actually explain why it happened. The Earth slowed down even more, allowing more cyanobacteria to produce even more oxygen. And so overall, this is a really brilliant discovery. It sort of combines the physical observations from the activity of the Moon and Earth and the tidal effects and links it all together to the creation of life and complex life on the planet and to the creation of oxygen on the planet as well. All together implying that the rotation of the planet is extremely important for the production of oxygen. The slower the rotation, the more oxygen you can expect. Or at least that's what it seems like. I'm sure some of the further studies might actually clarify this even more. But right now what this implies is that, well, when we're looking for some exoplanets out there, if they're spinning too fast, they might have a very similar problem. Any kind of a complex life present on those distant planets might just not get enough time to produce the energy it needs if the rotation of the planet is too quick. And so even though the phosphorus loving or any other chemical loving bacteria might be just fine, if the bacteria or cyanobacteria require sunlight, they might have trouble depending on how fast the planet is spinning. And so definitely a really, really cool discovery from this lake right here on the border of Canada. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about this somewhat groundbreaking research when it comes to predicting major weather events on the planet, and specifically events that we refer to as El Niño and La Niña something that I'm going to briefly explain to you in a few minutes. But more importantly, the study that you can find in the description below was able to definitively and statistically relate these events to what's known as the solar cycles, which, if the scientists are correct, can one day help us finally predict these very powerful events as they occur around the planet. But let's start with the description first. So, on 2021, our planet has officially entered the La Niña conditions, La Niña of course being Spanish for a little girl, and essentially being the opposite of El Niño, which is the Spanish for a little boy. Now the actual naming is not really that good, mostly because it just refers to two events that are opposite of one another, but originally El Niño stems from the phrase El Niño de Navidad, which was um, basically this unusual weather phenomenon that happened um, around Peru, and was basically a phrase that Peruvian fishermen used to describe this. But the event itself doesn't really have anything to do with fishermen, Peru, or Christmas. It's essentially a cyclical weather anomaly where suddenly a lot of the regions in the Pacific right here become much warmer than average. And here we're talking about 3 to 5 degrees warmer. And this usually lasts for some time, possibly a few months, and then disappears to reappear sometime in the future. But occasionally this anomaly switches again and becomes La Niña. Which, as you can imagine, is basically the opposite. The temperature of water here is on average 3 to 5 degrees colder. And interestingly, both of these anomalies influence the weather and various weather conditions on the planet in a pretty much opposite way. They're basically the extreme opposites of what's known as ENSO, El Niño Southern Oscillations. And you can kind of see the graph here showing us all of the years where El Niño occurred and all of the years where La Niña occurred with the most recent El Niño being right here, and now we've entered the La Niña event. But by just looking at this graph, it does actually kind of look somewhat random. Notice how sometimes there's a El Niño here, there's another one right here, there's nothing for a while, a lot of La Niña events everywhere, and so trying to predict them seems to be almost impossible. And because both of these anomalies refer to the changes in the average temperature of a pretty large surface area of the ocean, with El Niño representing the warmer and La Niña representing the colder anomalies, as you can probably imagine, both of these events end up disrupting normal weather patterns across the entire planet and can lead to some extreme weather conditions, including extreme storms or extreme droughts in various areas around the planet. Here are just some of the impacts between December and February during a typical El Niño, with the effects of La Niña and El Niño generally being the opposite. So, for example, a typical El Niño event will usually cause a lot of precipitation, a lot of rain and even storms in the northern part of North America, while also creating drought-like conditions in the south, including places like California and Texas, with these conditions generally lasting for about five months or so. whereas La Niña will do the opposite, it will produce a lot of rain in the south and a lot of drought in the north. But because these events seem to have global effects, they actually affect countries 
In Africa, they affect countries in Europe. They also affect countries in Asia all the time, including, according to some scientists, increasing the risks for certain viruses to spread as well. Trying to understand these patterns and especially trying to predict them is one of the most impactful things we can do today. Which is exactly what the scientists behind this paper decided to do. They tried to apply the old technique of analyzing solar cycles and they tried to see if there are maybe any patterns someone else missed in the past. But one major difference. A lot of previous studies usually focused on the idea of the solar cycle being 11 years long. And this is based on the observation of total sunspots on our sun. Every 11 years, the number of sunspots increases, then it goes down, then it comes back again. So this is what we refer to as the solar cycle or solar magnetic cycle. But inside of the smaller 11-year cycles, there is the larger underlying 22-year cycle. The 22-year magnetic polarity cycle. With the two halves of the 22-year cycle usually not actually being equal, one being a little bit more powerful than the other. And though the 11-year cycle is defined by the number of sunspots, the 22-year cycle is defined by the concept of polarity. So every 22 years, the polarity of our sun returns to its original spot. And the polarity itself, in some sense, can also be imagined as this. So basically, when the north returns back to the north, that's when the cycle is finished. And so in a way, this means that the actual solar cycle is 22 years long and the smaller 11-year cycles just represent two halves. And so by taking this into consideration and by choosing to go with the 22-year cycle, the scientists behind this paper decided to analyze the events known as El Niño and La Niña and try to see if they can discover any correlation there. And specifically correlating all of this to the event that they refer to as the Terminator event. More specifically, to try to understand what these Terminator events are, we have to understand how the sunspots form. So generally, we're not going to find any sunspots on the surface when the magnetic lines, for the most part, appear near the polar regions of the sun like you see on this picture. But as they start traveling across the solar surface for the 11 years, that's when you start finding those solar spots. And so basically when the magnetic lines are sort of like this, that's when we generally start seeing a lot of activity near the equator of the sun as well, or when a lot of sunspots start forming in this region. But every 22 years, a lot of these bands meet in the middle and to some extent self-annihilate. They basically disappear completely, leaving the sun more or less spotless. And this is what a lot of scientists refer to as the termination event, at least when it comes to the solar termination. And a lot of scientists today believe that this is actually the true cycle that our sun has, that it is after all 22 years long. And when the scientists in this paper compare the Terminator events with the El Niño and La Niña events, they actually found a surprising correlation. Every single of the last five Terminator events corresponded to a transition from El Niño to La Niña, just like it happened right now not so long ago. And so last year in 2020, we've transitioned uh, from El Niño to La Niña and it just so happens to have been yet another solar termination event where there were practically no sunspots at all. With the statistical analysis also suggesting that this is only about 1 in 5000 to be completely by chance. In other words, the correlation here right now is pretty high. But despite this very obvious correlation and despite this discovery, there is really no clear explanation on how this works. There's really no understanding right now how these solar cycles influence the climate and the weather on our planet, especially when it comes to these solar cycles. We know, for example, that during the higher sunspot events, we can expect slightly higher cosmic radiation from the sun and possibly the cosmic rays coming from here might somehow influence the upper atmosphere and thus change the climatic conditions thus also influencing the water temperature. But how this works, and more importantly what all of this means to the climate of the planet, that's something nobody knows right now. Okay, that's maybe not true. There's definitely a hypothesis for everything I just mentioned, but none of them are conclusive yet. There are no conclusive facts on what's really happening with the solar cycles and how they influence the uh, weather on the planet. Nevertheless though, this is an extremely important discovery, because if the scientists in this paper are correct, and if future papers can provide further evidence to this, we might have actually discovered a way for us to predict when El Niño and La Niña events occur, at least to some extent. And by predicting these events, we might be able to prepare ourselves for a potential drought or for a potential hurricane sometime in the future. 
Today, there is really no good way of predicting any of this. We don't really know when a drought might happen. For example, the drought in California seemed to have been somewhat unpredictable. Or the fires in Australia from last year were also somewhat unpredictable. But assuming that the scientists in this paper are correct, there might be evidence that some of this could be coming from the solar cycles. And if so, we might be able to predict it and prevent it in the future. But it's also important not to make any strong statements or any definitive conclusions just based on this one paper. Remember, correlation is not causation, and even judging from this graph alone, we can see that the La Nina and El Nino events are still not as easy to predict as just saying that they happen every 22 years. So there's still a lot of work to be done and a lot of analysis to be made. But because of this paper, we might have come just a little bit closer to helping us understand how weather on planet Earth works and how all of this might relate to the solar cycles as well. Something that one day we might understand a little bit better. For now though, I guess we're just still learning. Anyway, check out the paper in the description below. If you've enjoyed this video, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Also, maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel memberships, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.